She'd briefly considered putting the clients off for a couple of days, but the repercussions would be big, too big. And now, some eight hours later, as she stood on Sarah's doorstep preparing to knock, she didn't feel much better about things. In fact, she felt worse. She had done the only thing she knew how to do, and that was to act, to fix the situation at hand. But each action has a consequence, and her life seemed to have a whole new set of consequences lately. Hey, Sarah said upon opening the door. She leaned against its side and met Emery's eyes. Her hair was up, but as usual, strands had escaped. She seemed settled in for the night, cozy in the best kind of way. She didn't offer entrance, which spoke volumes. Hi. For what it's worth, I'm sorry today didn't work out. I was looking forward to it. I know. I accept your apology. Emery shifted. She felt nervous, off-kilter. Can I explain to Grace? She's asleep. It's past ten, Emery. She goes to bed at nine on weekends. Emery glanced at her watch as a million more self-recriminations warred inside her head. Oh, I didn't realize how late it had gotten. Sarah seemed to soften then and stepped out onto the porch. She was pretty disappointed you canceled, but I explained the situation. She'll be fine. Will you? Sarah offered a weak smile that didn't quite reach her eyes and moved into Emery, wrapping her arms around her. You are doing your job today. I get that. I just wish it had played out differently. Emery didn't say anything because she didn't know what to say. Sarah should be angry at her. She should be frustrated. She had been ready for both of those things. But the quiet sadness she was met with was a whole new kind of guilt that Emery felt right in the center of her chest. She'd let them both down, and they were accepting it. How had she let it get to this? Everything okay, sir? Danny stood in the open doorway of the apartment and regarded them curiously. Sarah took a step back and turned to him, brightening. Yes, just fine. Danny, you remember my friend Emery? He smiled. Definitely. Hi, good to see you again. You too, Danny. He looked to Sarah as if a thought had just occurred to him. Hey, I can find somewhere else to crash other than the couch if you guys want to hang out. What? No. Emery was just dropping off some paperwork. Danny looked from Sarah's empty hands to Emery's. But she forgot it in the car. What should have been an easy situation to navigate seemed to have thrown Sarah into panic mode. Emery reluctantly took her cue. I did. I left it. I don't know where my head's at lately. She hated the lie. Sarah met her gaze appreciatively. I'll walk out with you. Back in a sec, Dan. Emery walked a few paces ahead, lost in her thoughts, the stresses of the day, and what had just happened on the porch. So many things seemed wildly out of her control, her own emotions included, and it angered her. She wasn't a weak person, and she hated how vulnerable her relationship to Sarah made her feel. Em, wait, please. She did, but took a moment before turning fully to Sarah. I didn't know he was coming over tonight. His roommate invited over a bunch of friends, and he was looking for a quiet place to crash. He's your brother, that makes perfect sense. But? Here it goes. When are you going to talk to your family? Sarah sighed, her eyes finding the ground as she seemed to gather her thoughts. That's not a step I'm ready to take quite yet. Somewhere deep, Emery needed to know more. Will it ever be? She asked quietly. I don't know. And there it was. I'm not sure about us was easy enough to read in Sarah's guarded response. She didn't blame her. She couldn't. Emery nodded, resolute. She felt herself failing at what she'd known from the beginning would be an impossible scenario. I better get going. Here. She reached into the passenger seat and handed Sarah a few odd papers from her junk mail pile. For authenticity. She turned to her car, but Sarah's hand on her arm caught her attention. She looked as if she wanted to say something, but instead leaned in and kissed her softly. As she pulled away, 
Emery could see the heavy emotion in her eyes. Tonight was rough, but don't leave without saying goodbye. Never that. Emery felt a wall come down at the words, such a simple request that managed to touch something in her. Never that, she agreed, and stole a final kiss before driving off into the summer night. If only everything between them could be as simple. Hot or cold weather? They were lying in bed a week later. It was 3 a.m., but Sarah wasn't missing sleep a bit. She loved it when Emery stayed over. They'd spent the earlier part of the night lost in each other and welcomed the morning hours talking about anything and everything. With her fingertips, she absently traced circles across Emery's abdomen as she awaited her response. Hot. You? Oh, most definitely cold. Lots of hot chocolate and cuddling when it's cold. I mean, come on. Sarah lifted her head from where it rested on Emery's shoulder and shook it slightly, grinning like it was a no-brainer. Emery tightened her arms around her. Sounds cozy. I could be swayed to your side with that kind of thinking. Favorite color? Blue. Me too, but aqua. Sarah smiled to herself. Because you love the ocean. Favorite food? That's hard. Mahi-mahi if it's cooked right. What about you? Nope, you'll laugh. Emery slid down on the pillow so they were face to face. Oh, then you definitely have to tell me. Sarah scrunched one eye. Whopper with cheese. Emery's mouth fell open in playful surprise. As in Burger King? From all the foods in the world, you choose Burger King? They were laughing now. After a long day, there's nothing like it. I could go for one right now if I'm being honest. Emery pushed herself up. Then I'll be right back. Sarah pulled her back to bed and crawled on top. No way, you're not going anywhere. She kissed her. Too cute to leave. You know, your accent comes out when you're playful. It does not. She sank further into the kiss. Okay, except it does. Emery murmured as her hands drifted down Sarah's body. They were both a lot less interested in conversation after that. Dallas was hot. It was September and still pushing 90 degrees outside, a cherry atop the already difficult Sunday that had been Emery's day from hell. She decided to cool off with refreshment at the hotel bar before heading up to her room for the night. In the 45 minutes she'd been there, she'd refused drink offers from two different men and one woman, all the while desperately wanting the chance to sort through her own head for five damn minutes. Her workday at the Dallas office had not gone the way she'd planned at all, and she was pissed off. She thought back on the series of events and bristled all over again, knowing full well who was to blame. She'd had two Kentucky mules by the time her cell phone notified her of an incoming call. She rolled her eyes at the readout, but answered anyway. I shouldn't be talking to you. I should be lying on a highway hoping to get run over. Wow, kinda drastic. Bad day? Sarah asked. Bingo. She stirred her drink with the annoying shamrock swizzle stick. This wasn't even an Irish bar, for God's sake. Do you want to talk about it? Emery exhaled, softening. I didn't. But now that I hear your voice, maybe, I don't know. Okay, I can work with that. Sarah switched the phone from her left ear to her right so she could flip the pancakes she was making Grace for dinner. Let's try it out and see how it goes. Tell me what happened. Today I had to fire the two editors I told you about. Right, I remember. Did they not take it well? No, they took it fine, because I couldn't do it. What do you mean? You never got the chance to speak with them? No, I got the chance, but the moment I was face to face with them, all I could think about was what you said about them having families to feed and kids to put through college, and I'm dead in the water. Next thing I know, I'm flashing on an 18-year-old kid flipping burgers instead of growing up to be President of the United States, and I'm the reason. Sarah grinned broadly, still attempting to keep her voice entirely neutral. So what will happen to them now? I enrolled them in the new training with the rest of the Dallas editors, 
but I told Sheila to devote extra time to them, more one-on-one attention. I hate that I'm suddenly ineffective. This sucks. You're not ineffective. You're sympathetic. You took steps to make them better at what they do. If it doesn't work out, you can fire them later. Doesn't that sound like fun? I want to fire them now, Emery answered. I get that, and I'm sorry you're upset. If you were here, I'd take all sorts of care of you. I can't hang out with you anymore. You're warm and fuzzy and it's rubbing off. Sarah could hear the slightest hint of teasing in Emery's voice and took the opening. So I should make other plans for Friday night? Don't you dare. All right, all right, she chuckled. I'll pick you up at the airport at 6.30. There might be kissing, I can't be sure. Emery sighed audibly into the phone. Now I'm going to think about the kissing all night. Good. Now sleep tight and try not to be too mad at me. It's okay. I still like you. Wait, before you go, someone would like to say hello. Emery, it's Grace. What's Texas like? Seen any horses? Emery sat up a little straighter at the sound of the exuberant young voice. Hiya, kiddo. Dallas is hot. Negative on the horses. Lots of concrete and tall buildings, though. Oh, that's too bad. Hey, we're having pancakes for dinner. Isn't that insane? Mom and I have decided to have breakfast for dinner once a month. You should come over next time. I would love to. I make a pretty mean Denver omelet. I don't know what that is, but I'll check Wikipedia later. Night. Good night, Grace. I didn't imagine she would be as hot as she is, Carmen mused, stirring her peach tea. That's for sure. They'd come for their weekly get-together at Sabros and dined over a plate of sell-your-mother-for-guacamole nachos. Even Roman mentioned her undeniable beauty, though out of respect, I'll spare you his exact words. Thank you, but I have two brothers and I can imagine. So what exactly did you expect? Details. I don't know, someone a little more delicate and uptight with a severe hairstyle that says, I've got more money than God. Real life, Emery, while well-dressed, was actually kind of fun. Sarah smiled and relaxed into her seat. I love that you saw that. She doesn't always show that side of herself, and she should. So what's the update on that front? The update is that I miss her like crazy, She's been out of town on business all week and won't be back until Friday, which also, cue the ominous music, happens to be her birthday. Ooh, the birthday. That's a lot of pressure, sir. Any big plans? I'm picking her up at the airport, taking her to dinner where I'll lose myself in those baby blues that I haven't seen in forever, and then hopefully taking her home and having my way with her shortly thereafter. Speaking of which, would you be willing to keep Grace that night? She absolutely loves staying with you. You're sucking up. I like it. I'm sure we can work out some sort of exchange. My anniversary is next month and my rugrats simply adore staying with you as well. Yikes. He'll be fine. I'll draft you a survivor's guide. But if they get a hold of the scissors, you're on your own. Sarah sighed. It's a deal. So? Carmen managed through a bite of her nacho. Sounds like we're enjoying our newfound sex life. Sarah smiled shyly at the tablecloth. More than I ever would have dreamed possible. Carmen scooted her chair in eagerly. Specifics are definitely required. Are we talking gentle and easy or wild and crazy? I think we've managed both, and maybe a few other combinations. Carmen shook her head in envy and glared. Bragging is the instrument of the small and petty. Sarah grinned. You did ask. I did, and everything else is peaches and cream? Um, yeah, for the most part. Uh-oh. Don't say uh-oh, and don't take that last nacho. It's mine. Sarah snagged the last of the nachos and slid down into her chair at its wonder. Carmen eyed her knowingly. Don't use the nachos as a distraction. I know you, and there's something else on your mind. Tell me now or I'm getting up and walking out of here. And you know I don't make idle threats, so start talking. 
Five, four, three, two. All right, all right. A little extra aggressive with the mommy mode today, aren't we? Jeez. Sarah shifted in her seat. It's minor. It's so minor in the scheme of everything good that I shouldn't even say it out loud. But there are times when I feel like I'm, I don't know, out of my league with Emery, like I'm treading water or something. Out of your league? First of all, that's crazy. And second of all, what are you even talking about? Sarah took a moment and searched for the best way to articulate the nagging feeling she couldn't seem to shake lately. Emery travels all over the world. I've never even been out of California. She's practically a world-class chef, and I peek at chicken and rice casserole. She knows everything there is to know about classic art, and I watch Monday night football. Do you see where I'm going with this? No, I don't. I adore your chicken and rice casserole. Work with me here. Focus. Got it. Continue. It's almost as if we fit together, and I know we do, but our worlds don't. She's used to being on her own, nothing to tie her down, and then out of nowhere, there's this woman and her kid who has these heart issues and all sorts of ideas of family and staying home nights. I'm worried it's too much, that we're too much, and in the end, she's going to realize that. All right. I'm going to put it to you plain and simple. Are you ready? And please pay attention because this is good. So ready. Okay, here goes. You're a catch. Carmen sat back in her chair as if she'd just uttered the most brilliant words anyone had ever spoken and was now letting them marinate in the universe. I'm a catch, Sarah finally repeated with little conviction. Yes, you are in fact a catch. And so is your adorably smart daughter. You see, I've done the math. I've met virtually every kind of person, and you two are simply the best out of all of them. And I'm not just saying that because we're friends. I mean, if it weren't true, I still might say it. But in this instance, it just happens to be the truest thing on the planet. Are you with me? Sarah rested her chin in her hand and squinted. I'm doing my best. What I'm saying is that Emery is ridiculously lucky, and if she doesn't see that, then you need to move on and quickly. Sarah's eyes widened. No, I'm not saying she doesn't. It's just this little voice inside my head that gets my attention every so often. A little voice that you need to beat the hell out of until it submits to reason. Sarah laughed, her mood already lighter after talking with Carmen. So you think I'm pretty great? Carmen rolled her eyes. Whatever. You know I think you're freaking adorable, all right? Do you feel better now? As a matter of fact, I do. Sarah grinned triumphantly and grabbed the check. On me. Did I also mention that you're beautiful and smart, too? Because Mama could use a new pair of boots. Just saying. Chapter 14 it was finally Friday, and Emery was in high spirits. It was the first birthday in a long time that she was genuinely excited to celebrate. All she wanted in the world was a nice meal and the company of a very beautiful woman, one in particular. The year had contained its fair share of ups and downs, but she was feeling hopeful, and that was worthy of some celebration. She couldn't have been more excited to get off that plane and see Sarah and Grace, whom she'd not seen in six full days, a torturous eternity. She didn't know how she was going to maintain the usual stream of business trips her job often called for. Things needed to be different now, and some sort of Plan B might be in order. She'd talk with Lucy about it soon. As Emery made her way down the long corridor to baggage claim, she searched the faces of the eager family members waiting to greet their loved ones. When her eyes at long last landed on Sarah's, it was all she could do to maintain her steady pace and not close the distance between them in a less dignified manner, like an out-and-out -out jog. Instead, she shook her head, chuckling at the small sign Sarah held that read, Wanda, and then took in the gorgeous black dress she wore for their evening out. You look amazing, she said in Sarah's ear as she pulled her into her arms. You're sweet and have been sorely missed. 
Sarah held on to Emery for several long moments. Pulling back, she grinned, her eyes shining brightly. Happy birthday! Thank you. Emery took her hand and led them to the baggage terminal. As they walked, her heart soared. She'd found her balance in the world again. Can you not go away anymore? Sarah asked as they stared at each other lazily a few minutes later, waiting on Emery's bag to make its way around on the carousel. Already working on it. But in more pressing matters, what should we do tonight? Emery asked with delicious anticipation of the evening. And where's Grace? I thought for sure she'd have talked her way into making announcements over the PA by now. Grace is being well cared for. You see, it's somewhat of an important day, I'm told, so I took the liberty of making reservations for the adults to celebrate at Donovan's downtown. My treat. I hope that's okay. I know you said no party, but I wanted the night to be special. Thoughts? Sarah looked nervous that she'd made the right call. But in all honesty, Emery didn't care what they did as long as they did it together. But now that she thought about it, Donovan's would actually make for a really nice evening. That sounds like the best offer I've had in a long time. You, me, and some amazing food. Emery pulled Sarah's hand to her lips and kissed the back of it. Are you sure you don't want Grace to come with us? She's welcome. Nope. She's blissfully happy roughhousing with Carmen and her boys tonight, her idea of a walk on the wild side. She did send a gift for you, however, which I will give you later. Now? Emery asked hopefully, her right eyebrow arched. Later. Sarah shook her head at Emery's attempt to appear disappointed. So incredibly demanding. Thirty minutes later, they pulled into the drive of Emery's house. The idea was to make just a brief stop so Emery could change into something more appropriate for dinner and say a quick hello to Walter, who'd been tended to daily by Lucy in her absence. By the time they actually arrived, however, Emery was beginning to have other ideas. A passion had been lit when she'd first laid eyes on Sarah at the airport, and that slow building fire was now going strong. She'd stolen glances at Sarah throughout their time in the car, and just couldn't get past how wonderful she looked in that dress. The occasional placement of Sarah's hand on her thigh as they drove hadn't helped her plight all that much either. What time is our reservation? she asked nonchalantly as they made their way up the walk. Sarah glanced over at her suspiciously. Why? Just wondering how much time we had. A knowing smile took shape on Sarah's face, and she brought them to a stop on Emery's front porch. I know that look. I have a look? You have the best look. There's this hunger that shades your eyes, and every time I see it, it floods me with... Floods you with? All kinds of thoughts about you, us, together. Sarah took a step into Emery's space, her gaze taking on the heat Emery already felt. She slipped her hands under the front of Emery's shirt and delicately moved her thumbs in circles across the planes of her stomach, not once breaking eye contact. The reservations aren't until eight o'clock. We have a little time if you want to, you know, explore those thoughts I mentioned. God, you're so warm. Mm-hmm, Emery murmured absently in response. A lot of time between now and eight, a practical lifetime. Emery closed her eyes, unable to take much more of Sarah's teasing thumbs and the tidal wave of arousal they were unleashing. There was need coursing through her body, and she had to act on it. She reached blindly for Sarah, catching her by the waist and pulling her in tightly until their bodies met. Sarah gasped and captured Emery's mouth aggressively with her own. Emery slid into the kiss into lilac and cinnamon. It had been too long, she thought, too long since she'd held Sarah this way, felt her all over like this. Emery took control, deepening the kiss all the while fumbling with her keys to get them inside quicker. Damn it, she whispered when her coordination continued to fail her over and over again. I've got it. Sarah took the keys and easily let them in. Emery followed her into the darkened house and after only a few steps, wrapped her arms around Sarah's waist, and she kissed her neck from behind. 
she snaked up one hand to cover Sarah's breast, and with the other hand moved her hair to the side for better access to that neck. Baby, Sarah breathed. Stifled laughter emanated from somewhere across the darkened room. Emery froze. Sarah froze. The lights above them flashed to full illumination, and a house full of seventy-five smiling faces screamed in unison. Surprise! Fuck, Emery whispered. Oh, wow, Sarah echoed. Emery took a moment to process the scene, pulling her hands from their blatant placement on Sarah's body. There was a Happy Birthday Emery banner across the mantel and a large gourmet birthday cake on a table in the corner. Her closest friends and co-workers stood smiling in celebration of her, along with a few faces she was only vaguely familiar with. She managed to smile back at her unexpected guests and whispered to Sarah at the same time, Did you know about this? Not a clue, Sarah whispered back, doing her best to straighten her dress. What an embarrassing entrance they'd just made. Lucy emerged from the crowd, grinning. Sorry to interrupt, lovebirds, but we have some celebrating to do. That earned a collective chuckle from the crowd. Emery registered that music was now playing from her stereo system. Surprised? Lucy asked. She pulled Emery into an energetic hug. You have no concept of how much. Was this your idea? she murmured in Lucy's ear. Guilty! Lucy pulled Sarah into a similar embrace. This dress is beautiful on you, Sarah. Thanks. Sarah smiled but still looked a bit off balance. And about the party, I would have called to warn you, but I didn't have your number. Plus, Emery informed me last we spoke that she'd be home to feed Walter before going anywhere tonight. I knew she'd also want to freshen up after the flight. If nothing else, that part was a sure thing. That's okay. Sarah decided it wasn't necessary to point out to Lucy that she could have easily called over to Immaculate Home if she were serious about getting in touch with her, or that the press release she'd sent out with the Global Newswire listed her name, phone number, and email address under the contact information. Instead, she decided to look on the bright side of things and take advantage of this opportunity to get to know Emery's friends. So this wasn't what she had planned for the evening, big deal but she could still make the night into something special, and she would. Speaking of freshening up, Emery said uneasily, I think I'll head upstairs and get changed. Will you be okay? Of course. Emery met her eyes apologetically and squeezed her hand once before heading further into the house and up the stairs. I laid out an outfit for you that I thought you'd like, Lucy called after her. And there's a handsome someone up there who's dying to say hi, but hurry back. Emery shot a wary glance at Lucy as she ascended the stairs. Lucy then turned to Sarah. Come on, let me introduce you to some women you're bound to spend lots of time with in the future. Most of these girls Emery went to school with. We sort of hang out in a group, but don't let that intimidate you. Stick with me. Sarah smiled at Lucy gratefully and followed her across the room. She really did like Lucy, despite her audacious tendencies when it came to Emery. After preliminary introductions were made and a few niceties exchanged, the redhead in the group turned to Sarah. While she was overly pleasant, confusion was written all over her face. So, are you and Emery an item? Lucy laughed out loud. Geez, Mia, you know how to get to the point. I'm sorry, was that bad? Sometimes I forget myself. It's just that Emery hasn't mentioned you. At all. But we haven't seen Emery much lately. The woman named Barrett chimed in. That's probably why. Sarah nodded politely and addressed Mia. We've been seeing each other for a couple of months now. I've been anxious to meet you all. That wasn't exactly true. Emery hadn't talked too much about her friends, a detail Sarah now found interesting. Mia sipped from her glass and regarded her. You have the slightest accent. Am I wrong? A waiter whisked past with a tray full of white wine glasses. An actual waiter? Lucy snagged two and handed a glass to Sarah. You may need it, she whispered. She accepted the drink and turned to Mia. No, you're not wrong. English is my second language, and sometimes, especially when I'm nervous, my accent peeks through.
Where are you from originally? The blonde, Christiane, asked. She seemed to be examining Sarah as if she were a bug under a microscope. Sarah found this somewhat unnerving and chose instead to focus on Barrett and the warmth of her smile. Within the small group, she definitely seemed the most easygoing. I spent the first part of my childhood in Mexico, and then my family immigrated to California. How wonderful, Christiane answered a little too enthusiastically. I love this dress. Is it a de la Renta? Sarah glanced down at her outfit. No, I wish it were. Well, it's very flattering. Who designed it? Mia lifted the fabric delicately. Uh, I don't know. I saw it at a department store in the mall. Oh, fabulous, Mia said brightly and exchanged glances with Christiane. Sarah felt her confidence flutter beneath her. Barrett rolled her eyes at the exchange, and that was something. Sarah was pretty sure she wasn't the type to get caught up in fashion. She wore dark jeans, boots, and a sleek black shirt. Sarah could tell Barrett was a lesbian, but she wasn't as sure about Mia or Christiane. She would ask Emery later. Emery, who was taking an awfully long time getting dressed. She glanced wistfully to the second level. Upstairs, Emery surveyed her reflection in the mirror, but wasn't really looking. She was annoyed. Annoyed the night with Sarah had been so abruptly derailed. Annoyed that Lucy hadn't included Sarah in the party plans. And annoyed that she now had to go play nice with a house full of people she hadn't invited over. Walter pulled her from her mental rant, whining softly from atop her bed. When she'd first entered the room, he'd greeted her with the enthusiasm usually reserved for a prisoner returning from war. Emery knelt next to him and scratched his fur, happy to be in his company after her week-long absence. Lucy had dressed him in a smart red bow tie that he seemed to completely enjoy. He looked so handsome, buddy. He licked her face in agreement. Emery was grateful for Walter's recent presence in her life and kissed his soft nose now to tell him so. Here goes nothing, she whispered to him. Wish me luck. As Emery descended the stairs, the room broke into spontaneous applause and Sarah happily joined in. Sarah looked on with pride, taking in Emery's graceful transformation into guest of honor. She'd swept her hair up into a simple twist and wore a royal blue cocktail dress that hugged her just so. Now that might be a de la Renta, she thought to herself, still not really knowing. She looks gorgeous, Mia said to their small group, but then she always does. Sarah turned back to Lucy, intent on asking what she could do to help with the party, but discovered she was gone. She scanned the room and located her easily at the bottom of the stairs standing next to Emery. With a spoon to her glass, Lucy dinged until she had the full attention of everyone in the room. I hope everyone has a glass, she stated, once a hush fell over the party, because I plan to offer a toast to this beautiful woman next to me. You know her as Emery Owen. I know her as my savvy business partner and best friend. Thirty-three years ago, This firecracker entered the world, and it has never been the same since. She's amazing, smart, stubborn, funny, and confident. Unfortunately, in addition to all of those things, she's now old as well. The room erupted into laughter, and Emery turned to Lucy, looking appropriately offended. Finally, Lucy lifted her glass. A toast to you, my friend, for your energy, strength, and the many ways you continue to inspire us all. We love you. Cheers. They clinked glasses as Sarah watched, smiling. Christiane shook her head as she looked on. Tell me again why those two broke up? Sarah felt as if she'd been punched in the stomach. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Barrett nudge Christiane subtly. Sorry, Christiane said to Sarah. I didn't mean that the way it sounded, just a habit I need to break. They're ancient history, trust me. I do, Sarah said as politely as she could manage. If you'll excuse me, I should go find Emery. But it had been hard to hear. She struggled with the fact that Emery had once been with someone like Lucy. Lucy of the sleek, straight brown hair. Lucy of the sexy legs that went on for days. Lucy of the rich and successful. It was a lot to compete with. 
Hell, she knew who she'd pick between the two of them. No contest. With a shake of her head, she pushed the intrusive thoughts from her mind and focused on the task at hand. Unfortunately, finding Emery proved more difficult than she'd anticipated. There was an expansive receiving line of people blocking her path, all waiting to wish Emery a happy birthday. Rather than interrupt, she decided to wait it out. Taking a seat in one of the accent chairs across from the sectional, she made small talk with Emery's attorney and his wife while she waited. When she found herself alone again just a short time later, Sarah couldn't help but notice how unaware these guests seemed to be about the mess they were making of Emery's home. Small appetizer plates had been discarded in a pile on the coffee table. One had overturned and dripped some sort of sauce onto the hardwood floor. Knowing Emery and her stringently ordered house, she decided to help matters rather than waiting for the caterers to get around to it. She gingerly stacked the small plates and carried them into the kitchen along with an empty champagne flute. At least she could make herself useful and help Lucy with the gathering she'd known nothing about. Emery took in the state of things. Thirty minutes had passed since the toast, and she realized she was going to have to take drastic measures to get out of the endless receiving line. Who even did receiving lines anymore? Spotting Trevor next in line to speak with her, she seized the opportunity and whispered in his ear as they hugged, You have to get me out of this thing. He didn't miss a beat. Ms. Owen, you're needed in the kitchen, he said in an overly loud voice. And right away, catering emergency. Emery feigned surprise and took Trevor's offered arm as he whisked her away. She smiled and said hello to her guests as she passed, all the while scanning the room for her wayward date. I saw her head this way, Trevor whispered as he steered them behind the bar and into the kitchen. Sure enough, there she was, dutifully stacking dishes. What are you doing hiding out in here? Emery said, though there was a smile on her face. She took Sarah's hand. We can do those later, or someone can, maybe Lucy. She owes me for this. Have you eaten? Just a glass of wine, Sarah said, and covered Emery's hand with her own. It's hard chasing down those waiters. They're super fast. And then, I met your friends. You did? Which ones? Mia, Barrett, and Christiane. Lucy introduced us. The thought made Emery a little queasy. She'd wanted to control the flow of that conversation, as she knew how Mia and Christiane could come off. Plus, she felt so far removed from them lately that she now wondered what had brought them together as friends in the first place. Our parents, she reminded herself. Our parents had been friends. They have their good and bad moments, she said neutrally. I thought they were nice. Really? Sometimes they can be, I don't know, hard to read. Judgmental bitches, that's what she wanted to say. Sometimes they could be judgmental bitches, and she wanted to keep Sarah as far away from them as possible. I have an idea. Sarah eyed her. I'm listening. There's a tray of hors d'oeuvres over there with our name on it. Why don't we hit that up and have a nice little dinner in the laundry room, just the two of us, like we planned? Then afterward we can face the music and mingle with these people who have taken over my house. Me and my crazy appetite like this plan of yours. Are you sure we won't get in trouble? You know, for playing hooky from your party? You are the guest of honor. It's possible. This is a risky endeavor. Are you in? I'll take my chances. Sarah moved lightning quick to the covered tray. Emery heard someone in the living room crank the stereo up another ten decibels. They were entering phase two of the party, which meant the more respectable types would head for the door and the alcohol would flow more freely among the fun seekers. This was going to be a long night. Alone in the laundry room, they dined on the floor facing each other, Emery enjoying their impromptu picnic. Sarah grabbed for a napkin and raised a questioning eyebrow. Why is it we eat on the floor so much when I visit? Excellent question. Maybe it's just our thing. She considered this. I could be okay with that. It's kind of fun. No one else invites me to eat on their floor. I'm special, then. I've often thought so. Sarah surveyed the plate of white bean and caper crostini, stuffed mushrooms, and jumbo shrimp cocktail. It was an eclectic dinner, 
but one she wouldn't soon forget. Tasty, too. I hate that we were interrupted earlier, Emery said. Her eyes were dancing as she lightly dabbed a crumb from the corner of Sarah's mouth. Me too. I was thinking, maybe we can find our way back there later tonight. Well, in my experience, when it's someone's birthday, they get pretty much anything they want. Oh, good, because I really, really want you. Emery looked into her eyes. In case you haven't noticed, you make me happy. Sarah placed a gentle hand on her cheek as she listened. And I haven't felt... There you two are, Lucy announced. She sauntered into the laundry room with her hand on her hip. I hate to break things up yet again. I feel like I'm always doing that. But the birthday girl is sorely missed. Come on, woman, you're in high demand out there. Step to it. You can make eyes at each other later, I promise. Emery took Sarah's hand from where it rested on her cheek and squeezed it. Guess our time is up. Join me? Right behind you. I just want to freshen up a little first. Okay, you can use my room. Oh, and maybe bring Walter back with you. He's bound to be antsy up there all alone. He'll enjoy getting to meet everyone. Will do. I'll meet you on the front lines. Sarah grinned and offered a mock salute. The party was boisterous, Emery noticed upon her return, but nothing seemed to be broken or in danger, the main reason she didn't often give parties, so she decided to just let the night run its course. Someone had opened up the room to the outside, and many of the guests had taken up residence on the deck. A comfortable breeze moved through the living space, and everyone seemed to be enjoying themselves. She made a quick lap around the downstairs, saying a great many hellos and thank you for comings, before settling in with Barrett, who was generally a good person to stick by. Barrett looked at her apologetically. I told Lucy you wouldn't be wild about a surprise party, but you seem to be handling it rather well. Thanks, Bear. You're right. It's not exactly my thing, but I am happy to see you. I miss hanging out, the talks we used to have. Me too. We should make time to get together more, though you seem to have more on your plate than usual. She's gorgeous, by the way, and incredibly sweet. She is, Emery beamed, among other things. I think you're really going to like her. Like who, the mystery woman? Mia sidled up next to Emery with Christiane not far behind. She's not a mystery woman, Mia. Then why haven't you mentioned her before? It didn't come up. Emery tossed away the comment as if it was the most casual thing in the world, but Mia didn't seem convinced. On the second floor, Sarah took a few moments to run a brush through her hair and greet Walter properly. After her cheek had been thoroughly covered with kisses, she ushered him down the stairs to the party. His loyalty was fleeting, however, as he made a beeline for the outdoors, clearly looking for a good frolic by the water. Such a beach dog, she thought amused at his never-ending enthusiasm. She easily located Emery, engrossed in conversation with Mia and her set. She stood off to the side a moment and watched, proud of the confident manner in which Emery carried herself, complete with the dazzling smile that never failed to make Sarah's knees go weak. She was lucky, she thought, very lucky to be with such an amazing, intelligent woman. So where exactly did you meet Sarah, if you don't mind my asking? She's a client, Emery offered, refusing to give Mia too much information. Flashbacks of her sister's pretentious comments about Sarah raced through her mind in rapid succession. She wouldn't allow that kind of judgment at Sarah's expense to happen again, especially not from Mia. Well, that's not exactly true, Sarah said. She joined the group and handed Emery one of the glasses of wine she'd snagged on her way over. You were my client first, remember? Don't forget that part. Sarah shot her a questioning look, clearly not understanding the omission. Really? Christiane chimed in. In what regard? As you can see, Emery never tells us anything anymore. With good reason, Emery answered icily, a plastic smile in place. Unfortunately, it was shortly after Emery's mother passed away, Sarah began. I was hired to help prepare the house to be sold. She impressed me to no end and the rest is history. I'm keeping her. 
What about you, Barrett? I heard you were also seeing someone. How's that going? Sarah was again puzzled. She looked at Emery, who seemed incredibly eager to move on from the conversation, and it slowly began to make sense to her. Emery didn't want her friends to know that Sarah worked for a cleaning company. She felt the blood drain from her face as she stared, lost, into the depths of her glass. Before Barrett could answer, Christiane held up a hand. Wait, so Sarah was your realtor? No, Sarah answered, raising her head confidently. I was her cleaning woman. She faced Emery fully. Emery practically flinched at the words. Organization, mainly. She turned quickly to the group in explanation. Sarah actually runs the reorganization branch of Immaculate Home. They do some amazing closet designs. It's revolutionary what she's accomplished in such a short time. But back then, I worked for you, cleaning and packing up that house. Sarah emphasized each word. Right, I know. The smile slowly faded from Emery's face and she nodded. You're great at everything you do. Silence followed and Emery felt all eyes boring into her, but her focus was elsewhere. It was clear that the way she handled the situation had upset Sarah, hurt her even, which was the opposite of what she had intended. Her instincts had failed her again. Barrett graciously picked up the conversation and moved everyone into a teasing discussion about Emery's new dog that Sarah only half participated in. Eventually, she excused herself to call over to Carmen's and check on Grace. Emery found Sarah on the deck a short time later and waited briefly for her to finish her phone call. As she clicked off, she turned to Emery. I'm so sorry to have to do this, but Grace is allergic to cats, and I forgot to send her allergy medication that lets her be around them. I think it'd be best if I just picked her up from Carmen's and took her home. I understand. I'd go with you, but... Sarah looked around. You have a house full of people. Right. It's okay. Emery placed her hand on Sarah's forearm. Can we talk before you go? About in there? She inclined her head in the direction of the party. With the breeze from the beach lifting Sarah's hair gently, she looked breathtaking and a little sad. Sure. Because there were people nearby, Emery walked them a short distance away from the house to the water's edge. The sunset was all but gone, but lights from the deck allowed her to see Sarah's eyes. They seemed to be silently searching hers for some sort of answer. I'm sorry about the conversation back there and how I handled it. You don't know these girls, but I do, and I just didn't want them to rush to judgment. Mia's the type of woman who enjoys making other people feel small, and I wasn't going to let her do that to you. Sarah seemed to ruminate over the information. She looked skyward before settling her gaze back on Emery with purpose. Can I let you in on a secret? Emery nodded. I don't think I care what people like Mia think of me anymore, which is new because I've more than cared my entire life, but I no longer feel like that kid in junior high who just wanted to fit in and would go to ridiculous lengths to do it. Because since you've come into my life, I feel like I've learned so much about myself and for the first time ever, I fit. Emery felt that wistful lump rise up in her throat because what Sarah was saying to her was wonderful and terrifying at the same time. So I guess what I'm saying is that I don't need you to take care of me, but it would be nice if you could be proud to have me at your side. I am proud, Sarah. You're the best person I know. Please don't doubt that. Sarah showed a touch of a smile. See? then that's all I care about, and it's time for me to start being honest about exactly who I am, with your friends, with my family. Your family? Uh-huh. I don't know what to say. That's wonderful. Emery felt tears touch her eyes, because she was so very proud of Sarah and the strength she saw taking shape within her. Proud and so much more. The well of emotion rushing through her after listening to Sarah was unique, foreign, and undeniable on every level. Love. And while the realization should make her want to pull Sarah into her arms and never let her go, instead, it made her hesitate.
It brought to the forefront everything she knew about herself and all the ways she'd fall short of what Sarah needed. So, when she did finally open her mouth to speak, what she said was not at all a reflection of what she felt so firmly within her, because it couldn't be. It's getting late. I'll walk you out. She took Sarah's hand in hers and walked her to the front. The night hadn't gone as planned, but Sarah, in her unwavering goodness, had rolled with each and every punch. It was yet another testament to her character. Back when she'd made decisions about her life, she'd never planned on a Sarah, someone who would make her redefine her definition of just about everything. But here she was, standing in her driveway, looking back at Emery with sparkling hazel eyes. And then a dark reminder flared of the promise she'd made to herself not so very long ago. Sarah touched her cheek. I'll call you tomorrow, birthday girl. Emery attempted a smile. Sarah tilted her head to the side and studied her with concern. You okay? I can see if my father's free to pick up Grace. I was just worried that she might... I'm fine. Go take care of your daughter. Sarah nodded and leaned in to kiss her goodbye. Emery wrapped her arms around Sarah's waist and kissed her back for all she was worth, memorizing the moment. Late that night, long after all the partygoers had finally vacated her home, Emery tossed and turned, but sleep eluded her. Frustrated and looking for something to distract her overly active brain, she crawled out of bed and fumbled through her bedside table. She came across the small canvas book, The Last Journal. She settled in and let her mother's words take over. Normally, Sarah loved a free afternoon. She could take hold of the opportunity to organize the chaos that life as a single mother brought with it. And she did, stacking art supplies, unloading the dishwasher, sorting through all the clothes Grace had recently outgrown, all while keeping one eye on her phone. It had been two days since Emery's birthday party, and the four text messages and a voicemail she'd left for her had been answered with only one clipped reply. Busy week. We'll call soon. But Emery hadn't called, and something felt off. She'd give her one more day before taking matters into her own hands. It was possible that things at the office had truly picked up, and if that was the case, she wanted to show Emery she was capable of giving her space to get her job done. She wasn't a needy person, but she did feel she was owed at least a phone call in response to her messages. But late the next day, when she still hadn't heard anything from Emery, she arranged for her parents to keep Grace an extra hour after work. The sun slanted low in the sky as Emery set out for a walk along the shoreline to clear her head. She'd come home earlier than usual from the office, as the ever-doubling pile of work on her desk couldn't seem to hold her attention. There was too much on her mind. Once home, she'd swapped her business suit for a pair of cutoffs and a t-shirt. As she put on her shoes, Walter watched from a few feet away and panted hopefully as if his dream might actually come to fruition. Come on, buddy, she said, inspiring vertical leaping and all sorts of celebratory whining. It was a clear September evening on the beach, and Emery was relieved to find she had it mostly to herself. The setting sun caught the water's surface, and seagulls soared on the breeze overhead. Walter had tons of energy to burn and panted happily as they walked, but Emery couldn't identify. She'd been ineffective at work all week and had carefully avoided contact with Sarah, no matter how bad she felt about that. She'd needed the time. Her life over the past few months had been nearly unrecognizable. She'd let herself get carried away into a place she had no business inhabiting. It had been selfish of her. Sarah deserved someone who was capable of giving everything of herself and then some, and Emery just wasn't equipped. Her mother's words had reminded her of that just the other night. I was studying a photo of my father this afternoon and remarked how similar my brother looks to him now. Genetics is the most intriguing thing. My own daughters are the perfect example. Vanessa is an outgoing girl, the type who surrounds herself with the kind of people who can take her places. She takes joy in life, sometimes at the expense of others. In essence, she's her father's daughter to a T. Emery, on the other hand, is like me. She keeps people at a distance and always has. 
While incredibly talented and articulate, she's a hard person to know and always has been. She seems to have discovered what I never did and has chosen a life on her own, thereby leaving less damage in her wake. Sometimes it's like looking in a mirror. It had been hard to read. And while her mother was certainly not the foremost authority on her life, she had to hand it to her. Her points were valid. Emery came from a long line of emotionally stunted women. Her mother was distant and unavailable. Her sister was an irresponsible parent who had raised a pair of morally bankrupt elitists. And while she had opened herself up more to Sarah and Grace than anyone else in her life, what would happen in the long term? What hope did she really have? Who was she destined to become? She'd crashed and burned after two years with Lucy. She couldn't take Sarah down that road. She wouldn't. She started for home and didn't argue when Walter ran on ahead. When she arrived, she found him flopped gleefully on the deck in front of Sarah, his fur sandy and wet from the run. Sarah stroked his blatantly exposed stomach with affectionate vigor before lifting her eyes to Emery. I thought I might find you out here. Carr was in the driveway, but no answer. She was smiling, and Emery tried to smile back. She lifted a shoulder and let it drop. You found me. Sarah studied her as she continued to pet Walter. You've pulled quite a disappearing ad lately. New hobby? Sarah was attempting to be lighthearted, but Emery could sense her unease. She sat on the steps next to her. I've been busy. It's been crazy at the office. And yet, Sarah checked her watch. It's 5.20 and you're already home and changed. There was no hint of accusation in her voice, just a quiet observation. They stared out at the tide as the palpable silence grew and grew. Finally, What's up, Em? Don't you think it's time you told me? Communicated in some way? She nodded, knowing it was. I can't do this anymore, Sarah. I knew going in that it would be too difficult to combine our lives, and it is. It was a lie, or at the very least, an oversimplification of the facts. Sarah didn't say anything, and then, finally, So that's it? Just like that, huh? She nodded, seeming to let the words settle. Emery couldn't look at her. If she did, she would lose her resolve. My lifestyle is fast-paced, unpredictable, and that's what I need it to be. And that doesn't work. With an eight-year-old? She hated the way it sounded and swallowed hard. Yeah. I can't be a parent, Sarah. I'm not the kind of person who does well tied down. Sarah shook her head. Emery, this isn't you. But it is. That's what I'm finally trying to explain. I warned you from the beginning this wouldn't work between us. We burned hard and bright these past couple of months, but that can only last so long. She forgot herself then and allowed her eyes to settle on Sarah's. A mistake. The clarity of emotion looking back at her was almost enough to make her take it all back. Almost. Her voice, full of apology, began to tremble as she continued because it was the hardest thing she'd ever had to do. I care about you, Sarah. I just can't see you anymore. Please explain to Grace. Don't do this. Emery stood and took a few steps off the deck, hoping the distance would help. Please try to understand. Our lives don't fit together the way they should. Because if she told her the truth, if she had told Sarah she loved her but would be a horrible mother, Sarah would disagree, want her to try. Em, look at me. She did, but it was hard because Sarah's eyes were brimming. Finding you has been like a dream come true for me in more ways than one. Before I met you, I had no idea I was capable of feeling what you make me feel. So I guess that makes you my impossible fantasy, Emery. But I need you to want us, too. I just can't, Emery whispered. Then you've broken my heart. With that... She turned to go, and in a moment of panic for what she was giving up, Emery felt herself waver. Sarah, wait! But she didn't. She kept walking. Wait, where are you going? 
She turned back briefly. I'm walking away. You should recognize what that looks like. Those hazel eyes that had once smiled so magically were now guarded, closed to her, and the understanding slashed through her like a razor blade. Emery stood alone, staring blankly at her cold, sterile house with new eyes. Finally, she slid down onto the steps where she sat alone and numb for several hours. It wasn't until the next morning that she found the two neatly wrapped green and white striped birthday presents that were left for her on her front porch. Chapter 15 All right, that's it. It's been six weeks and it's time for you to talk. Carmen broke the silence as they sat on the bench at the small playground across from Sabro's. You asked for time to process, and I've given you that, and then some. But enough is enough. Sarah, you've been a walking zombie for well over a month now. Did she cheat on you? Is she a drug addict? Did she rob a convenience store? What? She studied Sarah's face like a super sleuth of all things relationship. She did cheat on you, didn't she? If I ever run into her, I swear I'll break. She didn't cheat on me, Carmen. Sarah placed a calming hand on her knee. She didn't want to talk about Emery because when she did, it was a hard place to come back from. Grace, not so high, she called. Grace was clearly enjoying herself on the swings with Carmen's boys. She's such a little daredevil lately, it's like she's testing me. Carmen looked at her hard. Don't you dare try to divert my attention. I'm not five. It took me forever to even get you out here and in the realm of semi-social, so start talking. It was true. Sarah had pretty much gone off the grid, needed to. Driving home from Emery's the day of the breakup without turning back was one of the hardest things she'd ever done. She'd tried a million times to rationalize the series of events. Going in, she knew something was wrong, and she'd known all along that Emery didn't trust herself in the relationship— but she'd hoped over time she'd find the same confidence Sarah had begun to find. But she had to look out for more than just herself. There was grace to consider, and she wasn't going to talk Emery into wanting to be a part of her life. Grace deserved more. And while deep inside, Sarah knew Emery's rejection stemmed from fear, she couldn't put her child in the middle. She spent the first two weeks after the breakup in the land of victimhood, feeling sorry for herself and needing to be alone. She went to work each day and came straight home, really only spending time with Grace. She'd wanted to call Emery a number of times, but she resisted as a method of self-preservation. She knew if she heard Emery's voice, she'd be back to square one, and that couldn't happen. Thank God for Grace. Even though it felt like her world had been flipped on its end, as long as she and Grace had each other, they would be okay. They had spent a lot of time cuddled up on the couch watching movies, but it wasn't long before Grace started questioning Emery's whereabouts and why she wasn't watching the movies with them any longer. Eventually, she had to level with her. Monster, I don't think Emery's going to be spending so much time with us anymore. Grace frowned. Why not? I miss her. She was going to teach me about color theory next. Sarah tried to explain delicately. I'm sure she wanted to, Grace. It's just that some things have changed between us, she and I. You're not dating anymore? Sarah decided honesty was probably the best way to go. Not anymore, no. Grace looked up at her, clearly crestfallen. But I really liked Emery. Hearing those words was like pressing on a bruise, and she steadied herself from the pain. I did too, Grace, but it didn't work out for us. Grace considered this before coming to a very resolute conclusion. Don't worry, Mama. You two will make up, like Mindy and me, probably soon. She seemed so very hopeful that Sarah didn't have the heart to correct her. It was in week three that the hardcore reality hit her. Not knowing what else to do, she threw herself into her work full force, anything to keep her mind busy. The article in the Union Trib certainly did a number on her client list. 
She'd had to hire her own receptionist just to keep up with her side of Immaculate Home and the huge volume of calls that were now tumbling in. By week four, the strange, numb, workaholic version of herself started to slide away, and underneath, she found that she still very much missed Emery. And not just Emery, her girlfriend. She missed Emery, the person. She'd come to be a lot of things to Sarah over the months they'd spent together. Her friend, her business advisor, her partner in crime, and then, of course, her lover. God, how she missed those intimate moments with Emery. The smooth, warm perfection of her mouth and the scorching feel of her skin against Sarah's. But there was still more. They'd laughed so much together. How was she going to make it through the rest of her days without that smile, those crazy dimples? For all her seriousness, when Emery smiled, it was like the sun coming out from behind the clouds, and Sarah could think of nothing else that compared. And here she sat in week five, trying to get herself back on track a little at a time, and there was now a glimmer of hope that all would eventually be okay. Of course, nothing had the same shine to it, but she was getting by. She could see that the life ahead of her would be clean and smooth, not exactly the place she longed to be, but not horrible either. It felt good to be out with Carmen, and deciding there was no time like the present, Sarah turned to her and sighed, laying out the series of events that led up to the moment they now inhabited. Knowing that Carmen would have a million questions, she did her best to spare no detail. Once everything was out on the table, she turned to her expectantly and waited. Carmen looked thoughtful, maybe even a little confused. And what did you say? Sarah shrugged. There wasn't a lot to say at that point. She made her feelings clear. She didn't see a future. And so you... walked away, cried a lot, and here we sit. Yeah, but is it possible that something freaked her out and she's scared? Sarah took a deep breath. Maybe, but that's not the point. In the end, she has to want to be with us. Grace shouldn't be a liability to anyone. Carmen nodded, mulling this over. I'm sure you're doing the right thing, but there must be a part of you that wants to know what changed her mind. Michael, if you don't stop hitting your brother with that stick, you are going to lose all bike riding privileges for fifteen days. Michael, wide-eyed, obliged and dropped the stick mid-wallop, and instead picked up a handful of dirt and dumped it over his brother's head. That's better, Carmen muttered to herself. Do you really think so? Well, I'm going to have to give him a bath now, but... No, about letting her walk away. Do you really think I'm doing the right thing? Quite honestly, no. I was just trying to be nice. I miss the spark I saw in your eyes after Emery hit the scene. It was like this breath of fresh air to see you so happy all the time. I understand why you're upset, I do, but in the scheme of life, sometimes you have to fight where love is concerned. God knows Roman isn't perfect, and some of the things he does make me want to shake him violently, but I love him. Do you love her, Sarah? That's not what we're talking about here. What's love got to do with it? A lot, Tina Turner. It has a lot to do with it. Everything, in fact. Love doesn't come in a nice, neat little package. It's rough and it's messy and there are always going to be issues. But if it's real, you don't give up. Can we not do this? Emery is a part of my past, and I have to do what I can to focus on the future. Carmen sighed and stood up. I love you and I'm here for you, but sometimes you frustrate the hell out of me. I just want to see you happy. Happy seems a bit lofty at the moment. I think I'll settle for just getting by. Carmen looked at her squarely. Make sure you're doing the right thing. I am, Sarah murmured. I am. Emery stepped back from the large canvas and studied the blend of blues. The texture wasn't quite right, but she knew how to resolve the problem. She reached for a brush a tad thicker in diameter and set to work emphasizing the rounded edge of the saxophone key until the shape filled in just as she saw it in her head. She'd been painting for three hours and her neck was starting to tug. Arguably, this was edgier work than she'd ever attempted before, but she acted with the kind of abandon germane to someone with very little to lose, and that's exactly how she felt. 
Her phone had been vibrating incessantly from the nearby stool it rested on throughout the day, but she'd paid little attention. It beckoned her once again, and she decided to finally take her sister's fifteenth thousandth call, or it was possible she would never go away. Hi, Vanessa. Well, it's about damn time. Do you know I've been trying to get you to answer this phone for a week now? Have you gotten my messages? I've gotten them. I've just had other things on my plate. Like what? We're family. I called your office and they said you were indisposed. When I pestered them further, they gave me Lucy, who told me you'd taken a leave of absence from the company. Is this true? It's true. Emery sipped from her cup of coffee. I'm in Napa, taking a little time for myself. Surely that's something you would understand. It's just not like you, Emery. You're a workaholic. Is this about Mother? Emery thought she detected a hint of compassion, a rare commodity where Vanessa was concerned. Nope, just about me. What are you doing up there? Are you with someone? She practically whispered. I forgot her name. Susan? Or is it someone new by now? I'm by myself, Emery bit out, which was precisely how she wanted it. She'd been in Napa, more specifically Calistoga, for several weeks now. The slower pace was exactly what she needed to gain some perspective and lick her self-inflicted wounds. She spent her days painting and reading books, either at the small house she'd rented or on the property of some of her favorite wineries. She kept mostly to herself, but enjoyed the anonymity the small tourist town offered. The nights were admittedly more difficult. It was in the later hours that her thoughts drifted to Sarah and Grace and the future she'd grown to hope for. It had been idealistic of her, she knew, and in the end, where had it left her? In the midst of a... What exactly was this? A midlife crisis? A re-examination of her place in the world? Who the hell knew? Why don't I come out and spend some time with you? Vanessa offered as if talking to a not-so-intelligent child. I'd rather drive a dagger into my skull. Whoops, too honest? Excuse me? Vanessa sputtered. Her enthusiasm deflated like a popped balloon. Just a joke. A lie. But I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. Plus, you have the girls. I'd hate to take you from them. Stay right where you are. All the way in Colorado. You're acting strange. Emery had to agree. All of a sudden, she was quite comfortable saying anything and everything on her mind, and that had the makings of a perfect storm. Hey, Vanessa, someone's at the door. Better run. Door people hate waiting. She ended the call just in time. Another minute and she might not have been so nice. She looked to Walter, who sat dutifully at her feet. That did not go well, she said. I think it got five degrees colder in here when she called. What do you think? His tail thumped wildly in support. She carried the brushes she'd been working with over to the small sink in the kitchen and set about cleaning them thoroughly. She'd gotten paint all over her cut-off overalls, but it wasn't like she minded. It had been a productive session. The brushes had been her birthday gift from Grace, and she handled them with the care she would a newborn child. She knew from the brand name that they had been fairly expensive, and the gesture was not lost on her. There had been a small note attached to the wrapped package, and despite her heart's protests, her mind thought it a good idea to play the words back in her head several times a day as some form of sick torture. Happy birthday, Emery. I hope your dreams come true. Maybe one day you'll want to use these again. Love, Grace. Along with them had come a canvas from Sarah, another expensive purchase. She thought a lot about Sarah and the hole she'd left and wasn't sure how to get her old life back on track, hence her sabbatical. She needed new surroundings, a different routine, and some space from the people she knew if she was ever going to allow herself to heal. However, she couldn't deny that the existence of Sarah and Grace in her life had kindled something within her, a renewed outlook on what her life could potentially be. And even if she couldn't have them, she refused to discount what they had done for her soul. Since she'd been in Calistoga, she'd fallen down the rabbit hole and rediscovered her love of painting, 
and it was not lost on her that this never would have happened had she not met Sarah. There was something that felt so very right about picking up a brush again, almost like coming home. Emery lost herself in her creations for hours at a time, shocked when she glanced up at the clock. Her work, now that she was older, seemed heavier, soulful. She thought back to her first night in town and the moment she'd set to painting for the first time in years. The result of that night's effort sat unassumingly against the wall in her bedroom. She'd stared at it, transfixed, for hours the following day, with virtually no memory of painting it. It was like her hands had taken over, needing desperately to recreate the face that had the ability to make her feel so much. Having had time to think, she'd resolved herself to the fact that all had worked out how it was supposed to. Sarah was from a place of warmth and was incredibly likable, representative of all things good. Her family was tight-knit and loving. Emery had been out of her depth, but no more. If nothing else, she could at least learn from Sarah. Emery vowed to herself that she would continue to grow and explore who she was and had the potential to be. The first step had been to take a step back from Global Newswire and gather her bearings. She'd lost perspective, she understood that now, and her life was becoming the Owen cliché. Fortunately, Lucy had been more than understanding and even applauded her decision when they'd met about it over coffee. I think this is a good move. This place can run without you for a few months, and I promise I won't run the company to rack and ruin. Everything will be waiting for you when you return. Emery smiled at her and set down her mug. Thanks, Luce. I have nothing but faith in your ability to handle everything. Lucy reached across the small table that separated them and covered Emery's hand with her own. You can still call her, Em. This doesn't have to be the end. She pulled her hand back. Even if I wanted to, you didn't see the look in her eyes when she walked off. I'd rather she shot me than looked at me that way. Plus, my mind's made up, Lucy, and it's up to me to figure out what to do with myself now. Lucy studied her. Things are different, aren't they? You're different now. Emery nodded, knowing that important changes had and would continue to take place in her life. The last few months, mother dying so suddenly, meeting Sarah and Grace, growing to love them, and then losing them both, too. These months have given me new perspective. Before Sarah, I wasn't living, Lucy, not the way I should have been. I need to do that now. It may have to be on my own, but I have to find a way to do more than just stay ahead at the office. Life is too short. Now this is the kind of thing I've been dying to hear you say for years now. Lucy came around the table and folded her into a tight hug. I'm proud of you, Em, and grateful to Sarah for her role in this. Emery finished cleaning the brushes, stored her paints away for a future session, and took a long, hot bath. The water felt amazing against her already sore muscles, and she took her time, allowing the unwinding process to have its full effect. She would never have allowed herself so much downtime just four short weeks ago. Her days and nights had been scheduled to the minute, and even if she did have an evening at home, it was with a stack of work in hand. She snuggled into bed for the night. Walter curled up at her feet, her always loyal companion. She reached down and stroked his thick fur, earning an appreciative sigh. After switching off the small lamp by her bed, Emery took a deep breath and made a cognitive decision to close off her mind. Beautiful hazel eyes had a tendency of creeping their way into her subconscious, and once that happened, sleep was a lost cause. Tomorrow is a new day, she reminded herself and she would find a way to somehow make it a good one. November was definitely no October, Sarah decided. Not even close. The golden, glorious blue sky of October had been replaced by November's bleak, daylight savings-induced darkness. The tree branches were bare and skeletal against the depressing pale sky. The temperatures had dropped considerably, and she never did purchase herself that new jacket. Sarah hated November. It couldn't win, as far as she was concerned. Halloween came and went. Grace had gone as Vincent Van Gogh, sans the ear. They'd attended her fourth-grade Halloween parade and then gone trick-or-treating with Carmen and her boys. 
She'd spent the following Sunday, as always, at her parents' house, screaming her lungs out for the chargers and avoiding any and all questions about her love life. As she walked Grace to the bus stop that morning, Sarah listened intently as she rattled off the details of the papier-mâché turkey they'd be making in art class later that day. This was maybe the fifth time in twenty-four hours Grace had explained the process, but Sarah made sure to smile and nod accordingly. Do you think there's a way to make the turkey actually gobble? Grace asked. Her excitement was insatiable. Maybe a speaker inside its body would work. Slow down, Miha. I think you might be dreaming a bit big, one step at a time. Okay, we can talk about the speaker later. Sarah shook her head in amazement. The kid was tenacious. They'd gone shopping at the hobby store the night before for some extra supplies. Grace was so incredibly anxious to get to work on her turkey, already affectionately named Leonard, that she scampered in short spurts ahead of Sarah on the sidewalk and then meandered her way back to add in extra needed details on her planned masterpiece. Probably, I'll make his feathers a mixture of different colors, but I want them to be as realistic as possible. Our classroom computer has Google, so I'll see if Mrs. Henry will let me print out some photos for accuracy. Grace walked backward facing her. Sarah reached out and smoothed Grace's hair. Sounds like a good plan. Do you think he would make a good centerpiece for our table when I'm done? We don't have any Thanksgiving decorations up, and our place needs some spirit. I think that could be arranged. Now give me a kiss. Your bus is pulling up. Grace obliged, planting a quick kiss on Sarah's cheek and heading off. Feeling the buzz of her phone in her pocket, Sarah glanced down to read the text message from her assistant, informing her that she now had a 10 a.m. consultation with a prospective client. Damn it, it was going to be a tight morning, but she hated to turn away good business. It was Grace's voice that pulled her from her thoughts. Mom? she yelled, sticking her head out of the door to the school bus. Have a great day! Sarah's heart swelled, and just as she opened her mouth to call back to Grace, she watched her body go limp and crumble like a rag doll, falling from the top step of the school bus onto the pavement below with a horrifying thud. The action of the world seemed to slow down around her as she looked on in shock. Sarah reached out helplessly, a silent scream of horror bringing her stumbling forward onto her knees. Grace wasn't moving. She could see that much from her vantage point. There appeared to be a small pool of blood forming beneath her head. Oh, God, no. In the midst of Grace's stillness, pandemonium broke out all around her. Children on the bus were calling out, another parent at the bus stop rushed to Grace's side, and the bus driver, dialing his phone, descended the stairs rapidly. In the midst of it all, Grace still had not moved. All sound disappeared then, and Sarah could only hear an intense roaring in her ears. She needed to get to Grace badly, but her body was not cooperating. She couldn't move. Grass. There was the cool, damp feel of grass beneath her cheek, and that was okay, she thought, as the world faded to black, because at least now she wouldn't have to watch her child taken from her. She wouldn't have to watch Grace die. Chapter 16 By the time Sarah came to, Grace had been transported to the hospital by ambulance. The other parent had ridden with Sarah in a police car, though her memory of the ride was almost entirely non-existent, except for the siren. She could still hear that shrill, horrible siren. Once she arrived at the hospital, Sarah was placed in a small exam room, and though the hospital staff assured her repeatedly that Grace was awake, she couldn't seem to stop calling out her name in a voice so racked with fear that she no longer recognized it as her own. She was asked a lot of questions, that part she remembered, about her name, address, and what year it was. All she could think about, however, was Grace's lifeless body as she'd last seen it on the cement below the school bus. The other mother, Trish somebody, stood at her shoulder, looking through Sarah's cell phone for someone to contact. I'm going to call your mother, Trish said. She pointed to the contact scroll in the phone. Is that okay? Should I call your mother? Sarah nodded numbly. Where's Grace? 
she asked the doctor, who was shining a small light into her eye. Her voice sounded hoarse from screaming, and she noticed that her hands were still trembling. Another doctor is in charge of your daughter's case, Ms. Matamoros. She's just a few doors down, and I promise they're taking good care of her. Now, can you tell me where you are? The emergency room. Please, let me see my daughter. Soon. We have to make sure you're all right first. You took a bit of a fall yourself. I'm fine, Sarah insisted harshly. She stood and moved deliberately into the hallway. I need to see my daughter. Now! Seeming to finally understand her urgency, the doctor led her down the short hallway to a nearby hospital room. There were several people bustling about the bed, but there Grace was, alive, awake, and looking more than a little afraid. Sarah forced a smile and kept her voice low so as not to disturb the medical staff. Hi, sweetheart. Everything's okay. Don't worry. How are you feeling? Grace looked pale and not so great. She could see that there were traces of blood still matted in her hair. Grace blinked up at her, tears in her eyes. My head hurts. What happened? I don't feel well. You fell down and bumped your head, baby. The doctors need to make sure you're okay. A petite brunette referencing something on a clipboard stepped forward. Ms. Matamoros? I'm Dr. Riggs. May we speak outside? Sarah nodded and kissed Grace's forehead. I'll be back in just a minute. You rest. Everything is going to be okay. Once they were in the hallway, Dr. Riggs didn't waste any time. The good news is that we got Grace here in very good time following her accident, and with head trauma, every second counts. At this point, it's encouraging that she's awake and conversing with us. However, she did sustain a significant blow and she seems a little bit fuzzy, disoriented, on and off. It's highly likely that she's suffering from a concussion, and I'd like to run an immediate CT just to rule out any complications. This is the kind of injury we have to take very seriously. Sarah blinked. Of course. Can I go with her? Sarah's heart raced as a myriad of terrifying scenarios played themselves out in her head. Certainly. It had been over an hour since the CT, and Sarah paced the hospital room anxiously, waiting for word. Grace continued to move in and out of lucidity and had recently grown more and more quiet. She's probably just exhausted from the ordeal, Sarah reasoned. Anything to keep herself from imagining something worse. Now it felt like a waiting game. Her mother and father had arrived, and they all waited, along with Carmen, in the common waiting room. Why haven't they come back, Mama? Sarah whispered. They're reading the tests, Mia. She's going to be just fine, I know it. But when Dr. Riggs emerged fifteen minutes later, the words she imparted to Sarah were not at all reassuring. She'd sat down with Sarah in the plastic chairs just outside the nurse's station. So here's what we know. The CT showed significant signs of elevated intracranial pressure, which is a swelling of Grace's brain due to the fall. I have to be frank, Ms. Matamoros. This is a big cause for concern and something we have to closely monitor. It's important that we do everything we can to stop the swelling and alleviate the pressure. What does that mean? Her hands were shaking in her lap, so she clenched them into fists. The next twenty-four hours will be critical. Sarah felt her breath catch as the blood drained from her face. The doctor took her hand. What that means is we need to give Grace's brain a chance to rest so it can heal, and we need to put her into a deep sleep so that can happen. She'll be unconscious for the next day or so, but if we can get the swelling down in the next 24 hours, her chance of a full recovery is high. Sarah couldn't think clearly. This wasn't part of the plan. When she spoke, her voice was barely a whisper. And if the swelling doesn't go down, what then? That's harder. The doctor squeezed her hand. If the pressure doesn't go down, or worse, it goes up, Grace could face the effects of brain damage, or... She could die? She could. It's a worst-case scenario, but I need to be honest with you. Let's just focus on these next 24 hours and getting her well. Sarah sat mutely in the waiting room. Her mind kept replaying the sequence of events on some unstoppable loop. 
her memory of the accident alternated between horrifyingly vivid and frustratingly blank. The small window across the room that offered a peek at the real world, the world Sarah could hardly believe still existed, showed signs of dusk falling. The clock couldn't turn quickly enough. Her brothers checked in hourly, but at her insistence stayed home with their families awaiting word. Carmen offered her encouragement, clearly doing everything a best friend should do, but Sarah couldn't find it within herself to say much back, because really there was nothing to say. Instead, she stared at the sterile double doors that led to Grace. Visiting hours in the intensive care unit were monitored strictly, and Sarah was allowed inside Grace's hospital room for twenty minutes each hour. She sat with Grace, who was covered with blankets and tubes, and looking so incredibly small that it about broke her heart in half. You're going to be okay, baby, she whispered. I'm right here with you. I'm here, Graciela, as she held her lifeless hand. In the hallway, the doctors murmured in somber tones to one another, but inside, Sarah stroked Grace's cheek softly, telling her one of her favorite stories, the tortoise in the hare. In the deep recesses of her mind, Sarah recognized with shocking horror that her beautiful, sweet, witty child might never return to who she once was, or worse. God, she couldn't acknowledge worse, but it hung over her in this endless nightmare. Sarah, you need to eat something, Carmen prodded her once she returned to the hellish waiting room. You've been here all day. Did you even eat breakfast this morning before? Sarah cut her eyes to Carmen and shook her head. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about me. I'm fine. I'm not in a hospital bed. Still, I think I said I'm fine. Carmen nodded resolutely. Time crawled by. Coffee cups came and went. The fluorescent lighting in the grim waiting room spared no detail of her family's fear-stricken faces. Her mother thumbed through a battered magazine from the rickety coffee table. Carmen scanned her phone. All the while, Sarah watched the hours tick by with excruciating delay. Finally, her father stood. Why don't I go pick up dinner for everyone? Nothing for me, Sarah said. You guys go ahead. Her eyes settled resolutely back on the set of double doors. Carmen joined him. I should update your brothers. Can I use your phone, Sarah? My battery is all but gone. Sarah nodded and handed her the phone. Carmen exited the waiting room with her father, leaving Sarah alone with her mother. She took advantage of the private moment. Mama, why did this happen? She doesn't deserve this. Of course she doesn't, her mother said. You don't either. No one does. God doesn't work that way. But here we are, and we have to be strong for that little fighter in there. Do you understand me? She needs you now. I'm trying, Mama, but I feel like I'm about to cave in. I can't seem to find the strength. I feel like crying, but I can't do that either. I don't think I can handle this on my own. I need help, but I don't know where to get it. Her mother scooted in closer and wrapped her arm tightly around Sarah and spoke to her quietly. This may surprise you, but do you know what helps me in dark times? Prayer. I haven't raised you in the church because that's not how I was raised, but in difficult moments, I turn to a higher power. There's a chapel down the hall. Do you want me to go with you? No. If I do decide to go, I think it's something I need to do on my own. By midnight, there was no real change in Grace's condition, but at least the swelling hadn't increased. She found herself in a difficult place and thought hard on it. Her mother was right. She wasn't a very religious person. She'd only been to church a handful of times in her life, mostly on Christmas. And even then it was kind of a formality. But she believed in God. She did. The hospital chapel was surprisingly small, with only four pews and a center aisle leading up to a modest altar. Above the altar hung a large stained glass window depicting two white doves in flight. Sarah took in the image before her, struck by its beauty. There was something about the quiet of the room that she found comforting. She glanced around, feeling unsure and not knowing exactly how to proceed. Finally, she decided to do what felt natural. She knelt before the altar, bowed her head, 
and took a deep breath. Here goes nothing. So I know I haven't been in touch in a while, and I'm so sorry about that. I don't know how else to say this, but I really need you today, and so does my daughter, Grace. She felt her voice catch and choked back emotion. She's only eight years old and not doing so well. Please help her through this. I don't think I'd survive if anything were to happen to her. She's my life. And lastly, God, I ask you to send me the strength I need to get through this and to give my daughter the support she needs right now. Please send me the strength, and I will receive it. Amen. Sarah raised her eyes and stared silently at the white doves for another few moments, when a feeling of calm slowly and inexplicably crept over her. She couldn't identify precisely its source, but she could detect a noticeable change in her resolve. She stood slowly and turned. The figure standing at the entrance to the chapel was dimly lit, but unmistakable. Sarah didn't hesitate. She moved to Emery and fell into her arms as a burst of tears sprang from somewhere deep within her. Emery held her for several long moments as she cried. I would have been here sooner, but I had a long drive. I came as soon as I heard. How did you? Carmen called me from your phone a few hours ago. Grace is going to come through. Know that. Sarah nodded, the tears falling freely now, as she clung to Emery and buried her face in her neck. Emery was here, and she would help her through this. Emery would be her strength, no matter what had transpired between them, that much she knew. They walked slowly back to the intensive care, Sarah filling Emery in on all that had happened. Emery greeted her parents and accepted a hug from Carmen. She sat next to Sarah and held her hand, not saying much of anything, seeming to know that was exactly what Sarah needed. It was 4 a.m. and time for another visiting session. Thus far, Emery had stayed back in the waiting area with Carmen while Sarah and her parents cycled in and out sitting with Grace. She would never want to intrude upon the family's space in any way. But when Sarah stood and held out her hand to Emery, she hesitated, glancing around the room, her throat tight. Are you sure? I don't want to take any time away from anyone. She'd want you here, Sarah said simply. Emery nodded and allowed herself to be led through the doors and down the hall. The sounds of machines hit her first. The steady sighs and beeps of the various devices hooked up to Grace took her back to the last time she'd been at the hospital, when her mother had passed. She measured her emotional response, determined not to upset Sarah in any way, and willed herself to hold it together. Pushing past that initial hesitation, she entered the room behind Sarah, who moved to the far side of the bed and looked back at her encouragingly. You can sit with her if you like. Emery nodded, sitting in the small chair next to Grace and taking her hand in hers. It was so much smaller in comparison. There was so much she wanted to say to Grace, and while it felt strange to talk to her this way, she knew this wasn't the time to hold back. Hey there, kiddo. I've missed you. Looks like you've taken creativity to new heights finding ways to get out of school. She glanced up nervously at Sarah before refocusing her efforts. Listen, I wanted to tell you something. I've been using those brushes you gave me. A lot, actually. And I think you'd really like some of the painting I've done. Surprisingly, it's not half bad. But you know what the interesting thing is, Grace? If I hadn't met you... I don't think I ever would have painted again. One of the things I love most in this world. That makes you very, very special to me. So this is what I need from you. Are you listening? She moved closer so that she was very close to Grace's ear. I need you to rest up and get lots better so that I can show you my work, the work that you made happen. Maybe we can even paint together sometime if your mom says it's okay. Sound good? Emery looked up just in time to see Sarah, who was staring at her so intently, with such emotion, that she almost couldn't breathe. She's missed you too, Sarah whispered. You should know that. Emery nodded, fighting against the lump in the back of her throat. She'd allowed herself to believe that Sarah and Grace had easily returned to their life without her, 
but sitting here now and looking into Sarah's eyes, she knew that wasn't true. She had been important to them, and even though that hadn't felt like enough a short time ago, it was everything now. I'll let you guys have some time. She leaned down and kissed Grace's cheek ever so gently and gave Sarah's hand a supportive squeeze across the bed. Sunlight dipped its glow through the window of the intensive care waiting room three hours later. Sarah sat next to Emery, who still held her hand loosely. They hadn't spoken many words to each other, but Sarah knew it was Emery's presence alone that kept her from climbing the walls of the hospital in utter insanity. It was then that Dr. Riggs arrived in the waiting room, bringing everyone to full attention in anticipation of any sort of news. Sarah stood and moved to the doctor, who wasted no time informing them of what she knew. The news is good, the swelling is down, and all is looking very encouraging. That is one very lucky girl you have in there. She's going to be okay? Sarah's heart hammered away in her chest. We'll want to keep her here for a couple of days to make sure there are no complications, but if we stay the course, I anticipate a full recovery. Dr. Thorpe will want to take this opportunity to implant a pacemaker to prevent any further fallout from her heart block, but I'll let him discuss that with you in more detail. Our plan is to keep her sedated until this evening, just to be cautious. In the meantime, take advantage of this time. Go home and get a nap and a change of clothes. You've been awake for close to two days straight, and pretty soon you're not going to be much good to anyone. You'll want to be refreshed when she wakes up tonight. Sarah couldn't imagine leaving Grace alone at the hospital. She shook her head to protest, but her mother placed a gentle hand on her arm. Listen to the doctor, Miha. I'll stay with her and call with any change. We can take turns. Do you want your father to drive you? Sarah turned to Emery, questioning. Emery nodded once. I'll take her. The apartment felt different to Sarah once they were inside, hollow and lonely somehow without Grace, not really her own. Emery was in the kitchen now, she registered, but she hadn't been able to move past the entryway. She just stood there, not knowing what to do with herself. Sarah? Hmm? She glanced absently at Emery. Why don't you go grab a quick shower and I'll make you something to eat? I don't think I can. Emery shook her head, but her voice was gentle. Not up for discussion. Sarah nodded wordlessly, grateful for the direction. She practically groaned with relief just minutes later when the healing hot water hit her body. She lathered her hair and closed her eyes, allowing the water's soft caress to work its magic. They'd all been right. She wouldn't have to make it much longer without some sort of reinforcement. She would do this and get right back to the hospital. When she emerged from the bathroom in her towel, there was a set of clothes laid out for her on the bed. She sent up a silent thank you for another decision she didn't have to make. She dressed quickly, taking note of the sizzles and sighs emanating from the kitchen. Her stomach, despite her mind's protestations, growled in response to the wonderful aroma of frying bacon. With her hair still wet, Sarah padded into the kitchen and sat at the table. She didn't fully imagine she could eat, but Emery went to the trouble, so the least she could do was act appreciative. What do you have going in here? Order up. Emery placed a BLT in front of Sarah, complete with a side of cantaloupe. Sarah contemplated the sandwich for a moment, which prompted Emery to nudge the plate just a tad bit closer. Eat. She looked up at Emery and dutifully took a small bite, which just about prompted her collapse. Wow! I took the liberty of raiding your fridge. Bacon is happy food, and we were given some happy news this morning, remember? Grace is going to be okay. I know it's been a rough time, but I need you to remind yourself of that. Sarah nodded and exhaled. She's going to be okay, and that is good news. It's just... I feel like I haven't quite woken up from it all yet. Not until she's home and herself again am I going to be able to breathe. Emery smoothed the back of Sarah's hair. She will be soon, but the first step is a little nourishment followed by some rest. Trust me, please. Sarah looked up at her solemnly. I do trust you, Emery. Know that. Emery nodded, took a seat next to Sarah, and together they ate in companionable silence. Once Sarah had gulped down the last bite, Emery cleared their plates and put the dishes away. 
Think you could try to get in a little nap? Nope. I'd like to go back to the hospital now. Don't you think it will be better for everyone in the long run if you're firing on all cylinders and capable of rational thought? How about ninety minutes? Sarah exhaled deeply. I need to be with Grace. And you will be. Forty-five minutes. Fine. She was annoyed now and it showed. I'll try if it will shut everyone up. It will. We will all shut up, I promise. Emery walked with her to the bedroom, pulled the sheets back, and fluffed the pillow. Sarah climbed into the bed, still shaking her head in frustration. Do this for Grace. She's a talkative kid and will need your full attention later when she wakes up. Sarah offered her a reluctant smile. Emery tucked her in snugly and placed a reassuring kiss on her forehead. Em? Sarah said as she turned to go. Yeah? Thank you. For helping me through this. How could I not? Her eyes met Emery's, and something important passed between them. Regardless of everything, it was understood that they mattered to each other. Finally, Sarah nodded and turned onto her side. In the living room, Emery stretched out on the couch, not having slept in some time herself. The apartment was small, however, and the unmistakable sound of Sarah tossing and turning in the other room had hold of her attention. It wasn't long before she heard footsteps in the hallway. She sat up and there was Sarah, eyes haunted. I don't want to be alone right now. Do you think you could lay in there with me? Emery hated seeing Sarah so crumpled in, so afraid. Of course I will. She took Sarah's hand and led her gently back to her room. Hesitating only for a moment, she climbed into the bed next to Sarah, who snuggled into her automatically. With Sarah's head on her shoulder, Emery acted on instinct, wrapped her arms tightly around her, and whispered in her ear, I've got you. Try to sleep now. Sarah clung tightly to her, and it was less than five minutes before Emery recognized the even breathing. She stared at the ceiling and silently asked God to watch over Sarah and give Grace the opportunity to live a normal, healthy life from here on out. For that, she'd do absolutely anything. Back at the hospital, Sarah was in slightly better spirits. She could think rationally and process the world around her more effectively. The short nap had made all the difference in the world. Her mother, who'd stayed with Grace when they'd left, had agreed to take a similar trip to her own house. That left her alone in the waiting room with Emery. She looked over at her. If I haven't said it, I'm glad you came. You put me back on track when I was just about to lose it. I was snapping at everyone. I didn't know how else to cope. Given the circumstances, I think you're doing just fine. I remember the day my mother was brought in and the way that felt. Helpless, angry, lonely, sad. The idea of Emery dealing with that loss alone made Sarah's heart ache. She'd wished she'd been there for her, wished she'd known. I didn't handle it so well. I beat the hell out of a vending machine when it wouldn't take my dollar. Something sparked in Sarah's memory. She sat forward in her chair and turned to Emery. Grace was admitted to this hospital on May 17th when she first fainted in her classroom. Emery tilted her head curiously. That's the day my mother died, May 17th. It was at this hospital, too. Sarah nodded as the understanding overtook her. I think I bought you a Diet Coke that day. Emery held her gaze for a long moment. No. That was you? That day at the machine? Sarah nodded. I didn't know it until just now, but yeah. Emery nodded. Her eyes glistened. I guess we've been there for each other longer than we realized. Emery? Sarah whispered achingly. She picked up her hand, needing the closeness. Tell me that you were just scared that last day on the beach. Emery met her eyes and nodded. For you. Sarah's stomach muscles tightened reflexively. And now? I think... It was then that a nurse burst into the room. Matamoros family, come with me right now. Sarah felt the blood drain from her face as terror infused her. She exchanged a glance with Emery and stood, staggering, but Emery caught her 
and practically carried her down the hallway after the nurse. Each step seemed to take a lifetime, each sound of her tennis shoe punctuated with a desperate prayer. As they passed, the sounds from the nurse's station seemed way too loud. What was wrong? What had happened? Please, God, not this. When she rounded the corner into the room, her daughter, her everything, smiled up weakly at her. Grace? She managed. Her knees threatened to buckle again, but Emery steadied her from behind. Grace held out her hand, and Sarah didn't hesitate, moving to her side and kissing her adorable little face. Hi, you kiddo. Hi, Mama. They were the most wonderful words in the history of words. As she explained to a slightly disoriented Grace why she was in the hospital, Sarah could simultaneously hear Emery in the hallway, quietly dealing with the nurse who'd taken ten years off their lives. Sarah looked up and smiled as she rejoined them, listening quietly from the doorway as Grace chatted away. Later the next afternoon, Dr. Riggs had Grace transferred from ICU to a regular room two halls over. Visiting hours were relaxed, and Sarah was able to spend more time with Grace, a welcome contrast to the hellish isolation of the waiting room. But the morning had tired Grace out, and she dozed soundly in her hospital bed, as always, immune to the sounds around her as visitors came and went. Emery had excused herself to the hallway to make a few calls, which left Sarah alone with her mother. It's nice that Emery is here with you. Sarah regarded her mother, taking stock of the situation. I don't know what I would have done otherwise. Her mother hesitated a moment, seeming to decide what she wanted to say next. Carmen mentioned something yesterday about Emery meaning a lot to you. Sarah didn't hesitate. It was time to put all her cards on the table and speak from the heart. More than a lot, Mama. I'm in love with her. The declaration was met with silence, but she'd prepared herself for that and worse months ago. It didn't scare her in the same way anymore. I'm sorry if that upsets you or shakes up your idea of what my life should be, but it's the truth, and I wouldn't change it. Her mother sighed, and Sarah waited to hear what she would say. This may surprise you, but I suspected. It more than surprised her. Sarah was floored. You did? At the birthday party, it was the way you looked at her, like she'd hung the moon. The way your father used to look at me. That kind of look is hard to miss. Why didn't you say anything? I don't think it was something I was ready to think about. This old lady needed some time. But after a while... You just seemed so happy in a way I had never seen you before, and that made me happy. There was a light in your eyes, Miha, the light I'd always hoped you'd have one day. But that light is gone now, am I right? Sarah nodded. A stab of remembered hurt hit her hard and deep. We stopped seeing each other. I see. And is that what you want? Sarah could tell this wasn't easy for her mother, but she was trying, and the least she could do was be forthright. She shook her head. Her mother took a deep breath and kissed her on the cheek. Then get the light back, Miha. Emery didn't want to interrupt. Sarah was having what looked to be a serious conversation with her mother. She watched through the small window in the hospital room door for just a moment before backing away to give them privacy. There would be a lot to handle in the next couple of days to get Grace home and recuperated fully. Once word of her recovery got out, the cavalry had showed up in full force. Her family and friends crowded the waiting room, dropping off gifts and food. There wasn't a ton she could do, and Sarah did have an amazing support system in her family, she reminded herself. So, she took a last glance through the window as she pulled her car keys from her pocket. She watched for a moment as Sarah and her mother talked. Sarah was smiling, and she couldn't help but smile, too, as something within her clicked into place. All was well. Finally, she forced herself to look away and headed off resolutely down the hallway, because there was something she could do for Sarah. So she found the elevator that would take her down to the lobby and out of the hospital. Sarah checked the nurse's station, the waiting room, even the women's restroom for Emery. She was nowhere. 
the talk with her mother had only confirmed what she already knew and set her on her way. Her heart was beating rapidly in anticipation of everything she was ready to say. It was time to put it all on the line. The elevator chime snagged her attention, and she turned as Carmen emerged carrying a giant balloon bouquet. When her eyes settled on Sarah, her face shifted to one of concern. Hey you, what's up? Sarah nodded her head a few times too many with all the nervous energy that rushed through her. Remember what we talked about in the park, about Emery? Carmen shifted her bag to the other shoulder and studied Sarah in confusion. Yeah? I think I'm ready to do that fighting thing you talked about. An extra-wide smile broke out across Carmen's face. Now that's what I'm talking about. Any last-minute advice? Say what's in your heart. You can do this. I know you can. One of my all-time favorite quotes says, Life is like a movie. Write your own ending. And that's what you're going to do today. Sarah thought on this and brightened. Who said that? I like it. Kermit the Frog. Carmen held up her hands in defense. What can I say? I spend a lot of time with people under the age of ten. It still applies. Sarah laughed. Now I just have to find her. Carmen gestured behind her. She got off the elevator just as I got on. She had her keys in her hand. Keys? But she didn't even say good... That's when the horrible realization hit. I have to go. She took the stairs because elevators were unpredictable. Bad idea. After racing down the six flights, she was wildly out of breath and the parking lot was huge. She stood on a cement bench and scanned the rows of cars. There she was. Not too late. Write your own ending. Encouraged by Kermit and the surefire fact that she loved Emery more than anything, she covered the distance to the car just as Emery was about to slide in. Em, wait, don't go. There's something I need to say. Emery turned curiously and pointed at the hospital, tilting her head in question. Did you just... Yes, but that's not important. Please just let me say what I need to say. Emery opened her mouth and then closed it again, seeming to honor the request. You can't leave. I get why you walked away before, but I shouldn't have let you. I should have told you that I love you. Because I do. Love you, I mean. And I'm asking you to build a life with us, Emery, and to give me what I never knew I needed. I want to make plans with you and change them as we go. I want the fights and the day-to-day -day and the milestones and the makeup sex and all the snarls and tribulations that come with being together. It's going to take work, and things are not always going to be perfect, but we'll work on it. We'll figure it out as a family. A soft smile appeared on Emery's face as tears touched her eyes. A family? Sarah nodded and took a step in. Yeah, you, Grace, and me. We're a team. So don't go. Emery paused and slid a glance to her car and then back to Sarah. So you don't want the Whopper? What? Lunch. I was going to pick us up something to eat. A certain someone favors Burger King, if I remember correctly. Sarah stared at Emery in confusion until the happy understanding settled. You're not fleeing the scene, she breathed. Emery covered the short distance that separated them, pulled Sarah in, and kissed her the way she'd imagined kissing her for the past six weeks. She sighed into perfection. Nope. Sarah was cradling her face and as much as she wanted to kiss her again, there were things she needed to address. But there have to be terms. Terms? Sarah's eyes widened. Okay, what are the terms? I love you. Sarah smiled, taking it in. I think I can live with that one. And you have to believe that I don't fall in love with just anybody. In fact, I have very high standards and always have. She picked up Sarah's hand and threaded their fingers. I happen to think that you are the most wonderfully smart, funny, and beautiful woman I have ever encountered, and I need you to accept that about yourself. It was Sarah's eyes that filled then, and her voice was meek. I can do that. I can try and do that. They held each other's gaze, 
the electricity between them already in full force. Emery's voice was quiet, and a small smile tentatively took shape on her face. So we're agreed? We are. One last thing. All right. Emery took a breath and tilted her head sideways. Can you say it again? Sarah smiled. Emery, I love you. I don't know why I thought it would be hard to say because it's not. I love who we are when we're together, and I love who I think we're capable of becoming. God, I love you too. Emery squeezed Sarah's hand. And I'm so glad I thought to get the damn cheeseburgers. They both laughed, and there was only one thing left to do. Her eyes dropped languidly to Sarah's lips as she moved in ever so slightly. We should probably shake on it or something. Sarah leaned in and hovered just shy of Emery's mouth, her voice a near whisper. Or something. But once we do this, it's binding. No going back. Got it? Only forward. As their lips met, Emery felt her world right itself, and she sank into the kiss. What they were embarking upon was scary, but she couldn't let that take precedence any more. This, right here in her arms, was what mattered. The last few days had shown her that. Connection to another person, in a life where nothing was guaranteed, was more precious than anything. The details all seemed so much smaller in comparison. As they stood there in the parking lot, the early afternoon continued all around them. Pedestrians bustled, and cars whizzed past, the midday rush hour in full effect. But Emery barely noticed. She was too busy dreamily kissing the woman she loved. It was a moment. It was the moment. Chapter 17 it was the first week of December, and as tradition dictated, Sarah had spent the entire Saturday baking cookies with the kids at her parents' house. Carmen had helped, and in good news, her boys had been less than destructive, only starting two food fights this year. Needless to say, it had been a day. The kids had long since retreated to the backyard for marshmallow roasting with their Uncle Danny, a part of the cookie-baking tradition Grace always looked forward to. A Johnny Mathis Christmas carol drifted in from the living room. Sarah looked around the kitchen at their masterful work and offered Carmen an exhausted high five. I'd say we conquered Cookie Land. Cookie Land had no hope. Next to them on the counter sat a stack of coconut macaroons next to a platter of peanut butter reindeer alongside colorfully decorated sugar cookies in the shapes of bells, stars, and remarkably accurate cutouts of Santa Claus himself. Prisoners of war, Carmen mused. I think we've earned a hot toddy. Sounds good. I'll make them, her mother called out as she walked into the kitchen. Not for me. Emery will be here any second. How do I look? She'd changed from her jeans into black pants and a form-fitting red sweater for their date. It was the first chance they'd gotten to spend time on their own together since Grace's release, and she'd been counting the hours. Smoking hot, sir. That's all I can ask for, she grinned, switching gears. Everything all right outside, Mama? The kids are having a ball out there. Danny's taught them his super slow roasting method and they're transfixed. How's Grace? Very energetic. I think her strength is back in full force. Clearly, Sarah said as Grace sped into the room and came to a stop in front of her. Can I have ice cream later? Grace asked, wiggling her eyebrows. If your grandparents say it's okay, but do me a favor and take it easy. Maybe don't run everywhere you go. Let's give that new pacemaker a chance to settle in. The doctor said it's fine to run now. Sarah sighed. That he did. She kissed the top of Grace's head and watched her speed back into the yard to join her cousins. She just seems so much lighter, carefree. It's nice. The cardiologist says that with the new pacemaker, she shouldn't see the inside of a hospital room until she delivers her first child. Her mother placed her hand on Sarah's shoulder as she passed. And now that Grace is back on track, it's your turn. As if on cue, the doorbell rang, and Sarah broke out into a smile. I think that's my date. 
The beach house was dark and quiet when they entered, but the moonlight reflecting off the water just yards away illuminated much of the room. Dinner with an adult had been just what the doctor ordered, and the fact that it was with Emery was delicious icing on the cake. Throughout dinner, Sarah had enjoyed the conversation, the laughs, the flirting, but she couldn't help letting her mind drift to the promise of things to come. It didn't help that Emery was looking both gorgeous and sophisticated in the pale blue dress she'd worn to dinner, her favorite combination. Now that they were alone, Sarah led the way in and wordlessly moved to the glass, staring out at the endless ocean. She wrapped her arms around herself and shook her head ever so slightly. The water seemed so calm tonight. Emery settled in behind her and gently kissed one shoulder. It's chilly out but we could walk down to the beach if you want. Sarah turned. I don't think so. I like it right here. She studied Emery's face, taking it in. What are you feeling right now? Emery smiled. You have no idea. Trust me, I do. She ran a finger gently across Emery's bottom lip and moved in, unable to resist her another moment. She brushed her mouth with a feather-like kiss and ran her hands gently up Emery's arms, the most tender of caresses. You were there for me, when life couldn't get any worse, when I was at my lowest and didn't know where to turn. You were there, and you got me through it somehow. I didn't know what I needed, but you knew. I didn't do anything that you haven't done for me. How is she today, Grace? Feisty, just like always. Only she can stay feisty longer now, so we're all in trouble. Emery laughed. I can't wait to see her. Tomorrow. Tonight I get you all to myself. Emery felt a shiver move through her body. She took Sarah's hand and kissed the back of it. Can I get you anything? Are you thirsty? Sarah shook her head slowly, her eyes never moving from Emery's, communicating so much. Emery nodded wordlessly and they walked together up the stairs, hand in hand. Once inside her bedroom, Emery moved to Sarah and pulled her close, her gaze unguarded, focused. I can't believe you're here. Sarah reached out and brushed a strand of hair off her forehead. We have all night, you know. Emery kissed her gently. Best sentence ever. The kiss that began delicately transformed rather quickly to a mechanism of need. Sarah moved her hands to Emery's waist and up. As they grazed the outsides of her breasts, Emery hissed in a breath and increased the pressure of the kiss until the meeting of lips and tongues vibrated through her entire body. As Sarah pulled off her sweater, Emery stepped back. I got it. She moved behind Sarah, pulling the zipper of her slack slowly downward. Emery assisted the lightweight fabric to the floor, bringing her to her knees and refocusing her attention. She closed her eyes and placed a solitary kiss on the small of Sarah's back, then moved her attention ever so slowly upward to her shoulders, the back of her neck, and around. Sarah's eyes were closed, her lips parted slightly at the sensation in a breathtaking display that caused Emery only a minor pause to take in the image before needing to taste that mouth once again. As their lips met, it was Sarah who took control at this point, kissing Emery hungrily and backing her up until the back of her knees bumped the bed. She slid the straps of Emery's dress down her shoulders, and it fell effortlessly to the floor. She stopped and looked at her, really looked at her, as her heart filled with something so familiar, yet so exciting that she felt a shiver move through her. She pushed Emery softly onto her back and took her time pulling off the rest of her clothing piece by piece. She willed herself to move slowly, to let the moonlight shift over Emery's skin as she revealed more of it. She descended to Emery's breast first, kissing it, taking time to linger, savor the taste, the moment, the sensation that was so all-consuming. She moved to the other breast then, licking, tracing lazy circles with her tongue. As Sarah raised her head, her eyes slid to Emery's, and the yearning she saw there sent a staggering shot of arousal through her. Em? She whispered reverently in response, kissing up her neck, her chin, her forehead, before finally settling back on her lips for another sensuous go-around. 
she settled herself more firmly on top this time. Em, look at me. Emery threaded her fingers through Sarah's hair, pulling her face back just enough to lock onto her eyes. I love you. So desperately I do. Emery's stomach fluttered as she heard the words again in such a vulnerable moment. She nodded as she looked up at Sarah and wanted to respond, to tell her of the strength of her own feelings, but her voice was strangled in her throat, the emotion too powerful. She opened her mouth to try again and closed it in defeat. I already know, Sarah smiled as she tucked a strand of Emery's hair behind her ear. I know how you feel, and it's everything good in this world. I'm so lucky. Unable to resist any longer, Emery pulled Sarah's face back down and caught her lips for another feverish kiss. She tried to turn them for better access to Sarah, to her body, but the once quiet, reserved woman she'd met those several months before was not willing to relinquish control just yet, and it was tantalizing. Instead, she pushed her thigh firmly between Emery's legs and began to move against her. Emery gasped and felt as if an electric current of yearning had just slammed her system. She arched in response and pushed back forcefully, grabbing Sarah by the hips and pulling her closer still, needing, wanting more of her. Not so fast there, Sarah mumbled between kisses, shaking her hair back, grasping Emery's wrists and holding them in place above her head. She picked up the rhythm gradually, and Emery could hardly maintain a coherent thought against the onslaught of overwhelming sensation. With her breathing ragged and her body erupting, she turned her head into the pillow and moaned quietly. Taking the cue, Sarah increased her speed, the pins that held her hair in place loosening and eventually falling out entirely. Her hair cascaded wildly down around her shoulders, and the sight alone sent Emery toppling over the edge in a rush of sharp pleasure. Her body stilled, and she called out as the orgasm ripped through her. In that moment, she reached up and touched Sarah's face, holding fast to the connection she felt so deeply until all she saw was her. All she felt was her. Sarah collapsed into Emery, and they lay there, tangled, smiling together. As her shallow breaths evened out once again, Emery gently stroked Sarah's hair, and her ability to think crept slowly back. You've destroyed me. I'm feeling strangely speechless. Sarah raised her head and grinned. I told you I'd missed you. But it was more than just that. Sarah exuded a quiet confidence that was new, surprising, and beyond sexy. Emery turned to face her more fully. You're a complex woman. Sarah looked skyward in jest. You noticed? I more than notice you. She gently shifted Sarah onto her back, and a new surge of heat surfaced in her as her eyes met generous curves and golden skin glistening in the moonlight. She ached at the sight of Sarah. She'd always thought her beautiful, but tonight she simply radiated. She descended first to Sarah's lips and then set out to explore. Kissing, tasting, licking. Emery savored every luscious moment with Sarah's body. Sarah was on fire. She had been ever since she'd first touched Emery, and her desire had only grown exponentially. She'd been turned on before, but this was a whole new level of yearning, and she didn't know how much longer she could hang on. Emery's mouth was storming her system, and sensation drenched her. As Emery kissed the inside of her thigh, she tunneled her hands into Emery's hair in an attempt to guide her to what she so desperately needed. Sarah's breath exploded in a loud gasp when Emery's hand finally found her, eased through slickness and began to move at an agonizingly slow pace. Moving her hips in response, Sarah arched upward in desperate search of purchase, of release. When Emery's hand was replaced shortly thereafter with her mouth, Sarah let control snap. With her eyes closed, she felt the shock of pleasure overtake her, and the past six months flash behind her eyes like a movie in her mind. As she wrote out the glorious release, she remembered the moments, the journey that brought them here, and her heart and body collided. With her heart still thudding in her chest like a jackhammer, her body still singing, and Emery's arms around her, Sarah knew she was home. 
Seagulls and the sounds of the early tide woke Sarah the next morning, and it only took a moment for her to feel the happiness moving through her in big, warm waves. She sat up groggily in bed and looked around for Emery. The door to the terrace was open, and the sheer curtains fluttered in the chilly breeze, a clue to her whereabouts. She crossed the room, shrugging into a t-shirt from the dresser as she went, when something caught her eye. To her right, there stood a canvas propped against the wall. She hadn't noticed it the night before, but then again, she'd been wonderfully preoccupied. She moved closer, stunned at the beauty, the simplicity of the image, and took a moment to let her feelings settle. She studied the lines, her own features so familiar, yet so new. Was this really the way Emery saw her? She picked up the painting, captivated by the window it offered into the artist's soul. It was the first thing I wanted to paint. I was a little out of practice, but in the end it came out just the way I wanted. Sarah turned to Emery, who stood in the doorway to the terrace. She wore a light blue silk robe and looked sated and beautiful after the night they'd shared. Sarah shook her head slightly in wonder. I don't know quite what to say. It's stunning. And she meant it. She'd seen Emery's work in subtle manifestations, but nothing like this. Nothing so complete. It was true. Emery was beyond gifted. Have you seen the subject? How could it not be? Sarah met her eyes in all seriousness. That's not what I meant. How did you do it? Capture me this way. Well... I happen to love your face, your hands. Emery pressed a delicate kiss into her palm. The way you move. I had dozens of images of you sliding through my head, moments of you attached to my heart, so I just picked one. Sarah looked back at the painting, for the first time noticing the glow on her cheek. This is from our first night together, isn't it? In front of the fire. Emery nodded. That was the night my life changed. Sarah nodded and caressed her cheek. Mine too. Emery looked down at the painting. I'd say you could have it, but I don't think I'm willing to let it go. That's okay. I was kind of hoping for joint custody. And, giving in to the temptation that had been with her since she awoke, she slid her fingers into Emery's sun-streaked hair and pulled her in for a kiss that left them both breathless and stumbling back to the bed. Epilogue Six Months Later The gallery was still bustling as they approached the last hour of the showing. Intense-looking people dressed to the nines perused the various pieces that lined the walls as waiters moved about the room with trays of champagne and canapes. Emery felt the butterflies in her stomach enter into a last dance and sighed in relief that she'd almost made it through. It was one thing to head up a multi-million dollar company, but quite another to have your art, your innermost expression, on display for the world to see and critique at will. She'd be lying, however, if she said it wasn't exciting at the same time. Because it really, really was. As she sipped her champagne in the corner of the room, she heard a patron's voice behind her. I can't stop looking at it, the male voice said. On each re-examination, I see something I hadn't noticed before, but by far, the most intriguing aspect of the piece is the way the artist juxtaposes nature against the urban landscape. I mean, look at that and tell me it's not thought-provoking. Find the gallery owner, his female companion said. Let's see what it's listed at. Emery hadn't been able to contain the small smile that grew steadily on her lips as the evening went on. She knew the opening's success would hinge on how many of the pieces actually sold, but for her, it was enough to hear that others appreciated her work, saw value in something she'd created. It came with a certain kind of gratification unlike anything else she'd experienced. The rush was palpable, indescribable, and immediate. She realized very quickly that she could get used to this. There's the famous artist now! Emery smiled in recognition of the familiar voice and turned just in time to feel the arms of Yolanda Matamoros envelop her in an all-consuming embrace. Yolanda, Emery had come to discover in recent months, gave the best hugs in the history of the world. She felt herself light up. I'm so happy you both came. 
You didn't have to, you know. Are you kidding? I miss all this? Never. It's an important night for you. Roberto placed a hand on her arm. Your work is beautiful, Emery. Yolanda thrust a camera at him. Take our picture, Berto. I'll say I knew her when. Emery wrapped an arm around Yolanda and smiled warmly into the lens. We'll let you get back to your show, Roberto said. We're off to see the rest of the paintings. See you Sunday for dinner? I wouldn't miss it. And she wouldn't. She smiled after the people who had become her surrogate parents, still surprised at how much they'd come to mean to her in such a short time. She made her way into the next room, where most of the work was displayed. The lights were dim, and mellow music emanated from the classical guitarist in the corner. She hadn't made it but ten feet into the room before Grace was at her side like a rocket. Emery, only two paintings are left. She smoothed the back of Grace's hair and looked down at her. That can't be right. Who told you that? The gallery owner, Melody. She said I'm her assistant. See, here's the inventory. She thrust the clipboard upward for Emery to see. Emery scanned the page in mystification. I didn't think too many would actually sell. She mumbled to herself as Grace scampered away. I did. Her favorite voice in all of history said in her ear. Emery turned around to Sarah's sparkling eyes. You're a hit. It's confirmed. I just finished talking to a reporter from City Beat. She's in love with your work and said to look for her review on Monday. How does that sit? Emery shook her head. Something about being in Sarah's presence made her incredibly honest with her feelings, and emotion was now bubbling to the surface in rapid waves. It all feels so surreal, in a good way, but still surreal. This was the kind of night she had imagined growing up, when she was young and the world seemed to have endless possibilities. She long ago stuffed those idealistic daydreams aside, and now, to actually have one come true, struck a chord. I don't know what to say other than, thank you. Sarah quirked an eyebrow. For what? Emery took Sarah's hand and pulled her into the corner of the room, outside the earshot of the meandering guests. For this. If I'd never met you, Sarah, I'd be sitting behind a desk at the office up to my elbows in paperwork, alone and unaware of how much life I was actually missing out on. Her voice softened. So yes, Thank you for coming into my life. Sarah didn't answer. Instead, she kissed her simply. I love you, you know that? Emery smiled. I do. It's awesome. Don't let me interrupt, Melody said, approaching. But I wanted to break it to you myself. She looked somber and Emery didn't like that. Okay, what's up? Is there a problem? Unfortunately... I'm afraid you're going to have to part with every last piece we've displayed at this little showing of yours. Melody broke into a triumphant grin. Wait, so that means... Sold out, entirely, and we're still getting inquiries. How fast can you paint, exactly? Emery laughed out loud. I don't believe it. It's pretty impressive, actually. I don't recall another artist I've worked with doing this well their first time out. Sarah squeezed her hand. Of course not. Melody checked her watch. We should be wrapping up soon. Shall we get drinks and discuss the future? Uh, can't tonight. She glanced at Sarah. We kind of have plans. Sarah nudged her shoulder. It's fine, go. No way. I've been looking forward to this. Melody, can we do it Tuesday? Tuesday's great, actually. I'll call you. And congratulations, Emery. You deserve it. Emery watched her walk away and turned back expectantly to Sarah. How quick can you wrangle the kiddo and meet me in the car? Time me, superstar. An hour and a half later, the kitchen table at the beach house was covered with blueberry French toast, hash brown potatoes, maple bacon, and Emery's contribution— hobo scramble, which consisted of eggs, cream cheese, scallions, and ham. Sarah had to admit, it all tasted amazing. Grace helped herself to a second spoonful of hash browns. I think I adore breakfast for dinner. 
Not more than me, Emery echoed. She sliced excitedly into her French toast. Sarah watched them, amused by their matching kid-like expressions. Over the past few months, she'd watched Emery slowly relax into life. She went into the office a couple of days a week to consult on any pressing issues, but for the most part, spent her time in the spare room they'd converted into her art studio or painted on the beach. Her eyes shone brighter, and she seemed so carefree, unencumbered. It was wonderful to see her so full of life. Mom, can I give Walter a piece of bacon? Sarah glanced over at Walter, who sat obediently back from the table watching each and every move they made as if his life depended on it. Sure, make his day. Walter accepted the offered piece of bacon with lightning speed and then licked his lips in gratitude. He collapsed comfortably back into his spot on the floor and rested his chin atop his toy raccoon, his best friend in the world next to Grace, whom he followed throughout the house religiously. That's a good buddy boy, Walter, Emery said affectionately. You are the cutest of the cute, you know that? His tail wagged in seeming appreciation. When dinner was done, Sarah and Grace worked together to clear the table as Emery started the dishes. Go get your pajamas on, monster, if you want to watch the movie. I'll finish up. Grace scampered up the stairs to her room, and Sarah brought the last dish to the sink. In doing so, she couldn't help but let her eyes drift down Emery's body in appreciation of her in those yoga pants. Her mouth went dry, as it always did where Emery was concerned. Mom, it's your turn to pick the movie. Grace's voice from upstairs brought her back from where she'd drifted, but not before Emery caught the stare. Emery was smiling as she shook her head. You cannot look at me like that. Not when our daughter will be back down here any second to watch a two-hour movie. Sarah feigned complete mystification. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm trying to clear the table. Could you focus, please, on the dishes? Emery moved in and stole a playful kiss. You're a bad liar. I will deal with you later. Sarah grinned. Then my plan has worked. Hearing Grace in the living room, she headed that way. Did you pick a movie, Mom? I'm in the mood for a classic. How about To Kill a Mockingbird? Oh, that gets my vote. Emery snuggled in next to Grace on the comfy couch, a Matamoros contribution to the beach house when they'd moved in. You'll like it too, kiddo. It's right up your alley. Okay, cool. Walter wedged himself tightly on the other side of Grace, placing his head in her lap as Sarah set up the DVD. She then settled in next to Emery and took her hand just as the opening credits appeared on the screen. Sarah looked across at Grace and exchanged a private smile, her mind drifting to how far they'd come in just a year's time. So much had changed, so much had fallen into place. But now, they were home. Her family was complete, and she was so very lucky.